Good afternoon and welcome to this joint oversight hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations and the Committee on Immigration and Local Law 30, the city's language access law. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, and I want to thank my co-chair, Council Member Carlos Menchaca, who has been at the forefront of fighting for improved language access in our city. So I thank you publicly for your leadership and the tremendous work that you have done. During the Bloomberg administration, there was an executive order on language access, <coughs> excuse me, that required agencies to provide services to the public in six languages. Last session, we codified and expanded upon that executive order by passing Local Law 30 in 2017. We increased the number of languages to 10. We mandated certain good practi practices, and we require regular outreach to language communities outside of the designated languages. Every agency is required to develop an implementation plan to be updated annually on how they will carry out that's that law's language access requirement. Today's hearing will be a discussion on those plans and, as a, and a discussion on how the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs has coordinated the city's language access efforts generally. First, I think it is important to say right up front that our review of the city's language access plans found those plans to be more in compliance with our law than not. So even though we are going to question and examine the parts of those plans that we believe were not in compliance, I will ask everyone watching this hearing to keep in mind that there is some good work in these plans too. Our goal for today is to improve the city's language access plans, but we are not starting from zero. Second, I will also ask people to remember that we're still early in the implementation of this law. Passing the law was not the end of the process for the City Council. And this oversight hearing, as this oversight hearing shows, we are committed to working together to reach a successful implementation by every cover agency. But as my co-chair will explain in a moment, the question of who can access city services is an incredibly important one and we must get this right. There are real consequences for people's education, housing, families, and well-being when they are unable to communicate with a city agency. We do not benefit when we isolate our neighbors. I encourage everyone here to keep in mind the real human cost if we do not implement this law well. And let me just say it right off the note before I close. Uh, I know what it is to, uh, having lived in Puerto Rico, only born here in the Bronx, but uh, been in Puerto Rico, learned Spanish, uh, end up in California, not being able to only say yes and no. And that was it. Uh, but I also know what it is to go through the shame factor, the fear factor, the anxiety, being afraid to ask questions that I should have asked uh, because perhaps of my accent, of what people, I thought people were gonna say, the mocking, the this and that. And that becomes, it was part really of the culture. So, uh, so with that, I, I want to thank the members of both committees for their time and commitment. I also wanna thank the staff of both committees. Brad Reed, Elizabeth Cronk, Zach Harris, Harbani Hahuya, Emily Forgoni, Irene Bykowski, and Jean Lee, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for the tremendous amount of work they put into this hearing. I look forward to our discussion. With that, I'll be glad to pass it on to uh, my esteemed uh, co-chair, Carlos Menchaga. Thank you. Chair Cabrera, and buenos, buenas tardes to everyone here today. I am Carlos Menchaca, Chair of the Immigration Committee, and really just proud to be here with you all today. I want to thank my colleague uh, and co-chair, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, the Chair of the Governmental Operations Committee, for extending the invitation to join today's discussion on this very important oversight topic. 
I also want to thank all the members of our committees that are here today. Uh, we're going to start with Mr. Ben Kalos, uh, Bill Perkins. We have Holden and Jaeger and Powers on the right. Thank you all for being here today. The dedication to our New Yorkers, our neighbors, with limited English. Um, no, and I want to thank all of you for the dedication to our New Yorkers to really engage in this discussion about limited access and limited English proficiency. I look forward to your contributions in this conversation. Today we'll be conducting an in-depth oversight of Local Law 30 of 2017. As Chair Cabreras shared, the enacted law requires covered agencies to provide language access services for all designated citywide languages. This law expanded the list of language, languages from the original six languages based on census data to 10 languages based on census data and the Department of Education data. Under the current data, this list encompasses Spanish, Chinese, all the iterations and both written scripts, Russian, Haitian Creole, Korean, and the newly added Arabic, Urdu, French, and Polish. Covered agencies were required by June 30th, 2018 to provide the City Council with their new language access implementation plans. Staff have spent the last several months poring over these plans, and we are here today to discuss the plans with the administration. I hope that by doing the heavy lifting and detailed scrutiny now, today, that we will set a good trajectory as we open the next chapter of the history of the city and its commitment to our immigrant communities. There will be time to ask questions concerning specific plans, languages, and Moya, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, efforts to ensure city compliance with the law. Before we get to this, however, I want to spend some time contextualizing this conversation. Language access can be the difference between using city services and living outside the many safety nets our city provides. In fact, for some, and I'll bring one story to mind, that effectively, effectively bans people from engaging, from, from service in their community, in their schools. Beyond this, language access ensures that all New Yorkers have an equal playing field when it comes to navigating interactions with city agencies. And many of you know the breadth of city interactions can be never ending from calling NYPD, to sending your children to school, to securing affordable housing, and filing a complaint or seeking information through 311, let alone the numerous specific programs and so social services offered by our different agencies. It's a reminder that we have, a, a rich, uh, uh, we have rich services here in the city, and all of them deserve to be accessed. And I know we usually, in the Immigration Committee, have a tradition of bringing impacted communities uh, today. I have uh, decided to illustrate instead a recent experience of a parent from Sunset Park in my district who was given a limited access letter by the Department of Education, the Public Safety uh, Division. This letter, dated on October 15th in 2018, restricted this parent's ability to access their child's school and was only delivered in English. Despite their request for a letter translated into their native language, Chinese. She never received one. The school did not submit a request to the DOE for a translated until October 24th in a meeting where I and some parents stood with the principal and the, the, the superintendent. This case raises many alarming issues, but the issue that I want to highlight here is the impact on our immigrant communities when our city agencies fail to provide that translation especially when it's asked for. This is inadequate. In this instance, this particular parent not only had to grapple with the fear and the confusion stemming from a letter of this kind of gravity, but also the fact that she could not understand its instructions. And as a result, she dropped off her six-year-old child with security. Her child missed a number of events at school, including mealtimes, and her child was so traumatized that she re resisted going to school after. While the DOE does not fall within the scope of Local Law 30, this case raises many questions. Should DOE, in fact, fall within the scope of this law? What steps is MOYA, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, taking to ensure that agencies, 
all our city agencies, including the DOE and other covered agencies, provide our immigrant communities the language access services that are critical, critical for them to navigate the city's programs, services, and their life. I'm looking forward to hearing from the administration concerning the compliance of local law 30, but I also want to make sure that we keep all of our services in mind as we think about moving forward. In addition to this, uh, I hope to explore uh, perhaps the requirements for city contractors and others to ensure that language no longer is a barrier. I want to thank Chair Cabrera again for his commitment to, to this issue and the incredible work of our committee staff and colleagues who took the time to comb through every submitted language access impl implementation plan. I saw the stack uh, of information and analysis. It's pretty hefty and really comprehensive. Special thanks to Brad Reed, uh, Harbani Auja, Emily Forgion, uh, Zach Harris, uh, Irene Bajowski, and their analysts, analysis. And to my staff, uh, Senior Advisor Cesar Vargas, Chief of Staff Soshi Meng, and Communications Director Tony Chira Chiarito. Uh, we've also been joined by Councilmember Drum. Thank you so much for being here today. And with that, I want to give the, ch the chair, um, no, with that, I want to bring our commissioner up to the dais and we'll swear you in. Commissioner Bita Mustafi, thank you so much for joining us today. And you'll kick us off and uh, we'll do the swearing in. Thank you. Hi, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Gracias a los miembros del Consejo por invitarme aquí hoy para hablar de un tema que es muy importante, que es el acceso al idioma para todos los neoyorquinos. Soy Vita Masofi, soy la comisionada de la Oficina de Asuntos Inmigrantes de la Alcaldía. Uh, Salam, es Shema, del Shore Yashar de New York. Uh, merci que me han dado el cardín que voy a tener un embrujo Darbore ye temi ke paraman is muy, muy, muy serio. Oh, now I'm mixing my languages. Ke muzui mohemme dasrasi zabon baro hamme ye adamay New York. Man esman bito mustafi hast. Man raiz daftar e umumuy mojahera shardar New York hastam. Merci ashoma. So. Thank you <laughs> um, to members of the council for having me here today to talk about this very important issue of access to language access for all New Yorkers. Um, as I started intentionally with the languages that I speak um, to uh, really uh, emphasize the importance of this work to me um, and to the work that we do in our office. I grew up as the daughter of immigrants who first arrived in the United States the year that I was born. I know very intimately what it meant to be the interpreter for my family in many situations and to help my parents through bureaucratic processes um, and have really uh, both wanted to celebrate the importance of having that language capability and the beauty of language diversity as well as the importance of making sure that we're reaching all of our communities in the most effective and efficient way. So thank you for calling this hearing. Um, so thank you to the chairs, Menchaca Cabrera, and members of the Immigration and Governmental Operations Committees for the opportunity to testify. As the commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the administration about our work on language access and the implementation of Local Law 30 of 2017. As I will describe, Local Law 30 has been a remarkably valuable tool in just the short period of time that it was enacted since last year. My office has coordinated the citywide implementation process and the agencies have done excellent work to improve their language access. I am particularly pleased to report that aggregate city spending on language assistance services saw a huge increase over the last year alone. From fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2018, agency spending on translation services through our citywide contracts 
rose 62% to a total of $3.1 million, $3 million. Spending on in-person interpretation rose 23% to a total of about $1.7 million. And spending on telephonic interpretation rose 31% to a total of $4.1 million. In sum, that represents an increase in spending of 38% with total spending in fiscal year 2018 of nearly $8.9 million. These increases reflect the deep commitment and impressive efforts by agencies across the city in response to local law 30 and Moya's implementation support. New York City is home to a remarkable diversity of languages and is a stunning number of residents who are not English speakers. This is especially true among the city's immigrant population. 76% of the city's immigrants speak a language other than English at home, and 49% of city's immigrants have limited English proficiency. Among undocumented immigrants, we estimate that nearly two in three, 63%, are LEP. The city government has enacted a series of laws and policies over the past 15 years to address these, these issues. In 2003, the city enacted Local Law 73, the Equal Access to Human Services Act, which mandated translation and interpretation services to be provided by the Human Resources Administration in six languages, Arabic, Chinese, Haitian Creole, Korean, Russian, and Spanish, and also imposed certain requirements of the Administration for Children's Services, the Department of Homeless Services, and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. In the continuing effort to ensure that persons eligible for social services receive them and avoid the possibility that a person who attempts to access services will face discrimination based upon the language she or he speaks. In 2008, Mayor Bloomberg issued Executive Order 120. This order expanded Local Law 73's language assistance requirements to all city agencies that provide direct public services. Local Law 30, enacted last year, codified and expanded upon Executive Order 120. It added four languages to the list of languages for which document translation is required, bringing the total to 10. It also expanded the types of assistance required in a number of other ways, including requiring that agencies provide direct public services, that provide direct public services must, provide telephonic interpretation in at least 100 languages, post multilingual signage about the availability of language access services, appoint language access coordinators, and develop and carry out a language access implementation plan describing plans for training agency staff, incorporating plain language principles into their materials, and informing community members about the availability of language assistance services. The law also required outreach in neighborhoods with large numbers of residents who speak languages beyond the 10 local Law 30 designated citywide languages to understand and help respond to the needs of those communities. Over the course of these developments, Moya has played an increasingly central role in the city's language access policies. Now, under Mayor de Blasio, Moya serves the charter-mandated functions of the Office of Language Services Coordinator in consultation with the Office of Operations. Local Law 30, enacted in early 2017, is among the most ambitious and expansive language access laws in the United States at any level of government. The law has incredibly broad scope, extending across nearly all city agencies, and requiring translation in at least 10 languages and telephonic ter interpretation in at least 100. Accordingly, Moya has developed and launched an implementation plan in two major phases, the guidance phase and the oversight phase. The guidance phase, which took place over the course of the first year of the law's effective period and was completed in June of this year, during this phase, Moya and the Office of Operations made the determination, based on our analysis of relevant data pursuant to the law's requirements, that the 10 citywide designated languages are Spanish, Chinese, Russian, Bengali, Haitian Creole, Korean, Arabic, Urdu, French, and Polish. Following this determination, Moya issued a memo to agency heads about the law. Moya also provided guidance to agencies to support the development of their required language access implementation plans 
and reviewed and provided robust feedback on agency's draft plans. Moya has also served as the clearinghouse and provider of best practices on language access services and agencies' implementations of the local law. This guidance work has taken a variety of forms, ranging from developing guidance documents to organizing convenings of language access coordinators from agencies covered by Local Law 30 to intensive one-on-one -on -one technical assistance provided by Moya directly to agencies. The guidance phase culminated in the publication of this past June of the nearly 500 page long Local Law 30 report, compiling agencies' language access implementation plans and providing additional background and information about outreach efforts. Moya has now turned to the oversight phase of Local Law 30's implementation. During this period, we will be going, um, Moya, which will be ongoing, I should say, Moya will be meeting with agencies to ensure that language access implementation plans are effectively implemented, holding multi-agency convenings to continue to share best practices, monitoring agencies' provision of language assistance services, and more. We've been working with agencies to address areas in which they needed additional guidance about the law's requirements, and we've been encouraged that the agencies have been eager to learn and improve on their language assistance services. I am pleased to report on the progress of many agencies in meeting these requirements, as well as examples of agencies' language access accomplishments that even go beyond the law's requirements. I would also like to note how engaged agencies have been regarding Local Law 30. Many agencies have proactively reached out to us to clarify the law's requirements, to get advice on how best to implement aspects of the law, and more. Agencies have secured or are in the process of securing the appropriate language services contracts. They have identified or are in the process of identifying their most commonly distributed documents and have translated or are in the process of translating those documents. They have also posted multilingual signage about the availability of free interpretation services and are training their staff on language access. Here are just a few highlights. At the Department of Social Services, HRA, staff use telephonic interpretation, 279,389 times in 2017. That's an average of 1,000 times per business day. Every HRA center has a free interpretation services poster in 19 different languages. The Commission on Human Rights has expanded its in-house language proficiency capacity to 35 languages spoken across the agency. The Department of Transportation has translated its documents into 13 languages, including Italian and Greek, in addition to the 10 languages required under the local law. In addition, DOT identified specific needs for certain documents and translated them into eight more languages, Hebrew, Punjabi, Tagalog, Fulani, Bambari, Twi, Nepali, and Tibetan. The fire department is in the final stages of preparing a new guide on emergency preparedness for apartment building residents and staff in all of the local Law 30 languages. The Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has been conducting fluency assessments of its own bilingual staff who want to qualify to provide services in languages other than English. And the Department of Buildings is using a customer comment card to receive feedback from LEP customers in order to improve their services. The central tool that Moya will be using in the oversight phase is the forthcoming annual reporting tool and template that will be launched in January. This assessment will help inform Moya's oversight and technical assistance across city agencies. Under Local Law 30, we also conduct outreach in neighborhoods with large numbers of speakers of languages other than the 10 designated citywide languages in order to understand the needs of these residents and to work with agencies to address those needs. For example, after successful town halls with the African community in 2015 and the Tibetan and Nepali communities in 2016, this year we hosted an Afghan town hall uh, attended by about 200 people and conducted in Dari and Pashto. We also hosted a Garifuna town hall attended by about 250 people. 
Through these meetings and other outreach work that Moya staff members perform across the city, we've continued to learn about and help connect speakers of languages beyond the 10 local Law 30 languages to their city government. As described above, Moya's work on language access long predates local Law 30 and includes a range of projects that are above and beyond the requirements of the law. For example, we work collaboratively with local government entities not covered by local law 30 to share best practices and guidance. These include the Department of Education, which we have worked with on a range of translated materials provided to LEP and immigrant students, including educational information on the Trump administration's rescission of DACA, anti-discrimination resources, and more, as well as NYC Health and Hospitals, which we've worked with on a multilingual open letter to immigrant patients issued jointly by Moya and h, &H. We've developed standard multilingual signage about the availability of interpretation for city agencies, and we've produced translations of the state voter registration form in 11 additional languages beyond the four already provided by the city's Board of Elections. As the agency functioning as the lead coordinator for language access across the city, Moya holds itself to a high standard for language assistance services. To ensure our standards are met, we have also begun using a secondary review vendor to perform additional quality control on translations. These efforts have resulted in increased accessibility to Moya and Moya-generated materials. In 2017 alone, uh, we arranged for the presence of 433 in-person interpreters at 153 events and translated up to 76 documents into different languages. I'm confident that we will continue to realize progress in language access due in large part to our agency partners' receptiveness and eagerness to improve the city's language assistance services for immigrants and LEP residents. I'm equally gratified by the attention of the council to the ongoing progress of the city government to speak to New Yorkers of all languages. My team and I have additionally been in conversation with the many dedicated advocacy organizations and community members who have been working in this area for decades. Input from these advocates and community members and from council members who have been working on this issue has been extraordinarily valuable in not only ensuring that New York City has the most ambitious language access law in the country, but also ensuring that that law is implemented as effectively as possible. I look forward to hearing more about areas where we can continue to collaborate. Thank you for the opportunity to describe our work and to hear further from you and from the city's residents about how we can continue to move towards a city in which language does not represent a barrier to accessing benefits and services. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Gracias a usted. Like my Arabic friends would say, shukran. <laughs> I Gan spoke Farsi. So. And my Ghanaian <laughs> friends would say, akwaba, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I just, uh, I'm gonna start with a few questions then uh, turn it over to a co-chair and then to our, our esteemed colleagues here uh, today. I know they have questions. So let me start, let me start a bit broad here. To the best of your knowledge, can you confirm with the local law 30 uh, report that Moya, submit, that Moya submitted is fully compliant with local law 30? And if not, what is missing? Sure, so thank you for the question. So I should note that in addition to Moya reviewing the language access plans, the Mayor's Office of Operations also did a review of the language access plans to show you how dedicated we are to this. Um, we provided updated plans to, to the council, as you know, in September, and that was because we wanted to ensure that the plans actually reflected the full requirements of the law and were as robust as they could be at this time. Um, so you have those updated plans as a part of the oversight that we've already done. Um, we are now in the process of, of, as I noted, working with the agencies on the full implementation. We will certainly know more um, about what that implementation looks like after we get reports for this year, which as I noted will be, uh, we will share with folks our, own, our template for responses in January and we'll have those by mid next year. So you sent a, a report in September, you mentioned? We sent additional updated plans, yes. To who, you know? Because our staff has not received it, maybe went to a general. It went to your spam boxes? We'll have to look to make yeah, sure. Can, can, <laughs> can you, 
your staff coordinate with our yeah. staff yeah. to make sure that, uh, yeah. that we could get it. Yeah, of course. Because we want to get credit to credit is due. Please, yes, we want to get that credit. Okay, uh, so let me move on to the next question. And as you know, Local Law 30 requires agencies to post both their current implementation plan and the name and the title of the, the language access coordinator to the website, but committee staff found several cover agencies have not done this. Have you checked for complying with this requirement, and when can we expect all agencies to be compliant? So thank you for the question. I, I would say we have not done sort of a, an overall check on every single element of the plans for all the agencies. Part of that is because agencies are still in that implementation phase, um, which is what this year forecasts for them. We will get the reports from agencies um, in, at the beginning of next year. We will then follow up to confirm that everything is in compliance so that we can report to the council as we're required to by mid next year. So you have to wait for their report before you check their website? I mean, they are given this period of time to do full implementation. Okay. And agencies have you know, begun to focus on different areas, right? So. Um, if there are specific concerns for agencies that have not yet posted, we can absolutely follow up on those concerns. Um, we have not uh, placed in any particular order for them the requirements on what they move first, um, but we'll be going through to make sure they've done everything that they're required to do. Have you found that most <laughs> of the agencies are reaching out to you regarding the website, being specific regarding the website, they're reaching out to you uh, regarding consultation, advice, regarding the website? Uh, regarding what to do in regards to the website? Right. No, but as I noted, we're happy to directly reach out to, to, to them. Um, that's obviously one of the requirements, and so we will be looking to make sure that they've completed that. You know, one of the things might be helpful is to reach out to all the agencies as they're in the process. Yeah of implementation, if they need advice, consultation, or help, that, you know, that help is readily available. Uh, so, so yeah, absolutely. So in addition to the guidance that we've given out, we've already convened all the language access coordinators three times. Our next convening is actually next month. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we see as an ongoing part of implementation and oversight. Um, and so, it is, they, they both know through our, the convenings that we bring them together with, but on a weekly basis, we're providing technical assistance to agencies. What's the biggest challenge the coordinators are bringing up to your attention? Um, I would say um, that it varies by agency. Um, so for some agencies, you know, we have got, we've asked them to go beyond sort of direct translation of their documents to putting their documents into plain language. So that's it, in and of itself a skill um, that we've been working with agencies on and that they're looking at training for their staff for. So that itself takes a lot of time. Obviously the quality assurance of the agencies um, and as they're continuing in the development of their plans and making sure that they're effectively implementing them, making sure that the contracts that they have has been won are in place, that they know how to effectively leverage them. The theme actually for our next convening is around how to best utilize the services that are available through the contracts so that they're getting the most effective uh, translation and interpretation from those because that's something that we've heard is, you know, I'm not getting back the highest quality. How can I, how can I better get that? So we're hearing the feedback on an individual agency basis. They're, as I said, diverse because the agencies are so diverse, um, but we're trying to address sort of overarching themes um, through convenings and best practices as well. You kind of uh, started to answer uh, my next question, but I want to give you an opportunity to expand on it. For agencies who have yet to identify and translate their essential documents, we Moya uh, review each agency list of essential documents for compliance. So we've, we have left it up to the agencies to identify what those documents are. 
um, and begin to move those documents to the stage of translation. But yes, we're asking for what the documents they identified were, the volume of the documents, et cetera. So you'll do a thorough review? Of which documents they translated? Yeah. Which they did or didn't? Um, we had not intended to look at the ones that they didn't, um, just because, again, when you're talking about an agency, it could be a voluminous amount of documents. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as we're going through the process, um, we, will, we will take that into consideration in terms of what we're looking for. I have more questions, but uh, I want to turn it over. Uh, thank you so much. Muchas sure. gracias. Yeah. Uh, I want to turn it over now to my co-chair and then thereafter to our colleagues. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you again, Commissioner, and for your opening as well. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, just a moment to, to be thankful for, that the, the leadership in our, in our city really reflects the, the nature of our, of our reality on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so it's just really beautiful to hear the languages um, that you speak. Mm -hmm. And the, the focus on my next set of questions, and I'll do a first round and then come back after the, the members uh, ask the questions, but really kind of focusing on the language service coordinator, um, or essentially the office, mm -hmm. the charter mandated office of the language service coordinator. Who holds that title? Sure, so thank you for the question. So. Um, I think as you're aware, the Office of Operations is listed in the charter um, as being the Office of the Language Services Coordinator. MOYA's charter also requires that MOYA perform functions of uh, serving and engaging limited English proficient New Yorkers and New Yorkers who speak all different languages. We, under the de Blasio administration, so several years ago predating Local Law 30, had a conversation with the Mayor's Office of Operations about this work, the importance of this work to both offices and the ways that we could partner together to ensure the you know, utmost effectiveness at driving this work for the city. Um, and from there have, have driven it forward together. So what I would say is Moya brings a particular expertise and skill set around working with immigrant communities, direct contact with communities and advocates and providers to understand what the needs are. Um, we've helped develop the methodology and the way that we look at what the languages are and the needs of, our, our, of New Yorkers are. Um, OPS has continued to play the role of oversight with us. So as I said, also reviewing all of the plans, providing feedback on the plans, they serve as the citywide, essentially, agency that's responsible for customer service, and language access is under that, so they provide trainings on language access um, as well, and provide uh, oversight to make sure that things like signage and so forth are, um, are placed correctly uh, in the agencies for in, in the right view. They also provide trainings and instruction on plain language and how to put documents into plain language. So I think um, from our perspective, it's a smart partnership <laughs> in advancing the, goal, the shared goals of the work um, and we're leveraging each other's skills to do that. Uh, so what I heard was, was a real kind of goals-oriented commitment by both operations and MOYA to the, the kind of mandate itself. And I'm kind of looking for a human and title holding the, the role. Yeah. Is there, is there a person that's? Sitting next to me. Okay. So <laughs> can, they, can they introduce themselves, please? Hi, my name is Oh, um, and let's swear you in, actually. Brad, can we swear? Thank you, sorry. Do you swear or affirm tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Anne Montesano, and I am the Executive Director of Immigrant Inclusion at Moya. Great, and so, so just because just this is in some ways a lot very technical and we wanna, I wanna ask the question. So is this essentially, um, because that title isn't necessarily the uh, language service coordinator. And so we're looking for if effectively that is your role as the leader of the office of the language service coordinator. 
Is that right? So um, she is leading the work for the office. We've actually talked about a title change to make that more clear, okay. <laughs> um, including executive director of language access and interagency initiatives. Um, so that's something that we were, we've talked about moving towards in the interest of transparency and for people to know who to go to for these issues. So Anne oversees both the work around local law 30 implementation, but also our language services work, which I described as being, which is quite, quite robust. Okay, so, so right now it's not, not that, but you're in conversations to make it that. And so that's, that's part of how we're trying to figure out the, the kind of charter, there's a lot of conversations about the charter right now. Yes. And so this is an opportunity, you know, is this, does this become a topic at hand and how to really think about maybe the charter's old, maybe it needs to get updated, maybe we need to change it. And so this is, this is why we're, we're really engaged in, the, in this kind of transparency oversight component mm -hmm. to the person, the human, the humans um, of New York who are working on this mm -hmm. and, and making sure that that's clear uh, not just for responsibility but all, and accountability, but also just for us to, to be clear about, about roles and roles. And so, so essentially, and you, and your last name again? Montesano. Montesano. Uh, are effectively the kind of language service coordinator leader. And so tell me about your role and how you interact with other agencies uh, and other coordinators at these agencies? Sure, so Moya does extensive one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with agencies, and that is driven by agencies reaching out proactively to us, and then us as well kind of identifying um, sets of agencies to um, reach out to on certain issues, and then we also do um, language access coordinator convenings uh, several times a year to bring agencies together to share best practices to ensure that agencies are aware of uh, the resources that they've developed so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel but can learn from one another so it's not just coming from Moya to agencies but it's, it's there's a lot of cross-sharing as well and I understand that you're convening the coordinators soon again, maybe this month or uh, next in November. Month? Next in November. Month. In November. Great. And so, how many staff do you have working for you uh, in this effort to support the language service coordination? Sure. Um, so we work with different um, agencies, um, and so we have a, a couple of staff. Um, one who is responsible for local law 30 oversight. Um, and then one staff who is responsible for the language services piece, which is really the um, ensuring that interpretation and translation services are happening at, at Moya. And, and say that again, you, you said um, the first one is local 30 oversight, and then the second one was? Language services, so language in particular services. interpretation and translation services, so liaising with our vendors, you know, when events come up needing interpretation, we have a point person who coordinates that. I would just add to that, that one of the things that they've been effective at doing too is as issues are identified, um, putting forward uh, ways that we as Moya can test solves for those issues. Um, and kind of piloting them through the work that we do before we share out suggestions to other agencies. Got it, got it. Uh, and, and who are those people, the local 30 oversight, uh, who are they? So Ken Lowe is here. Ken, hi Ken, <laughs> how you doing? Um, and who's the language, uh, language services interpretation person? Santiago Torres who is not here right now. Great, so essentially you, you're a team of three, is that right, as I understand? We have fellows as well. That Say that again? We have fellows also. That fellows, mm -hmm. okay. How many fellows do you have? Two right now. One, one right now, yes. One right now, possibly two in, yeah, in general. They, they come on a yearly basis yep. to, to support the team. Great, um, and, and so I'm, I'm assuming, so the next question is kind of in, in assumption, <laughs> but does Moya have the designated a uh, designated unit assisting agencies with language access? I'm assuming you are that unit. Yes. Okay, great. And then, how many people on Moya's staff have, la have language access compliance and outreach as their primary job responsibility outside the unit that you have? 
that we've have identified. language access as their primary responsibility? Yeah, and outreach. I mean, so, so I would say there's overlap there. Um, okay. So we have this year additional staff who are assisting us um, with different language access projects. Um, so three additional staff this year that are doing that. Um, we have um, an outreach team that does this work, um, some of which I described, particularly in, in engaging communities who speak different languages who, we've, who are less engaged um, and newer and not included in the top 10. One of the things that that team has done, which has been really remarkable, is um, uh, in the last three years done an annual International Mother Language Day celebration. Um, part of that has been responsive to some of the feedback about um, communities, and uh, I think you spoke, Council Member Cabrera, to um, some of the shame that communities might feel, and also the, the um, conversely, the pride, right, in having the languages um, and wanting to pass those down. So we actually started to do that as an annual celebration to honor the diversity of the languages in the city and to celebrate them. Um, and so our commitment through that work um, and through that team is to continue to do both of those things. Additional folks advise on issues um, as they come up, particularly legal or policy, obviously focused, um, and how best to address them. And then as we've been looking at, uh, again, solves for um, uh, challenges that we see, um, we've pulled in different people to help think through solutions, particularly from ops, from an operational um, space as well, and some of the ops folks, Francisco is here as well. Got it, got it. And so I'm, I'm kind of getting a sense of, of the different teams. Is there a way that you can just kind of give us a number of the, t the staff that has it as a, has it being the language access, compliance, and outreach as their primary job, and then those who are maybe in, I think you're kind of describing as, as projects, side projects that are working on things, but maybe have it as a secondary or just one component of their, of their larger job. Sure, I mean, I would say it's, it's three who it's central to the work that they do. And then this year, as I said, um, up to, uh, I would say four additional who are working on this. Um, and then that doesn't include um, the outreach and engagement work where you have a few additional staff who, who do that work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, should agencies rely on the volunteer language bank to provide language access services uh, as some plans indicate that they do? Um, so uh, the, the question being, should they? Yeah, and just and this is really out of kind of an advocacy uh, opportunity for you as Moya. So sure. really asking Moya, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, should they be allowed to rely on that? So the, the best practice and the guidance that we've given to the agencies as it relates to local Law 30 implementation has been to um, have their own contracts with vendors. Um, and to move towards um, ensuring that agencies um, are leveraging professional interpretation um, for at a professional interpretation where interpretation is, ne is needed and then translation for the service. Where we've recommended that VLB is a good resource that they could go to as a first cut is for review of translation. Um, so getting that, those second eyes from perhaps a native speaker or a certified speaker, um, recognizing that it's a volunteer language bank. So the speed is sometimes not as quick as you might need for translation, but the review process is easier for volunteers to do and can take less time. Um, so we certainly think there continues to be a place for the use of, of, of that volunteer language bank and certainly a way I think to build the community of city workers who speak languages and help build their own professional development as we've done before and helping them get certified. Um, but there are, there, I, we think our, our best practices in terms of professional services um, and how you use that bank. Got it, and so help me understand, because uh, uh, you're kind of anticipating the next piece, which is the certification component that you mm -hmm. just mentioned, mm -hmm. and whether or not there was funding that was kind of Moya driven to, to get the volunteers to certif certification as interpreters? There was when we did it, yes. When you, 
when you did it. Yes. Okay, tell me a little bit about that and the timeline and, and what, what's um, been happened since then. Sure. I think the last time we did it was maybe a couple of years ago. Um, and we had, if I'm, I'm getting nods, so I'm saying that correctly. Um, so, and um, we had uh, a one-time budget to, to provide the training for um, city workers who wanted to have that professional development opportunity um, to be able to go through that certification process and have that. Okay, final question. These are all super technical. Uh, really because we want to kind of get the oversight done, but also the charter, thinking about the charter, sure. we want to continue this conversation even after this hearing. Sure. On the budget lines, uh, does Moya, uh, the staff who work at Moya on language access appear on a single budget line or the budget lines of multiple agencies? Uh, and if they are in multiple agencies that we just discussed and identified before, uh, what agencies are those? Sure, within? yeah, multiple agencies, so agency partners, um, Largely from DCAS, yeah. All, all of those, uh, including? DCAS and HRA. Montesano? Montes She's, yes, DCAS, yeah. but DCAS, DCAS and okay. HRA. And HRA. Yes. Okay, majority DCAS, majority D HRA? Um, if you're if you're talking about the three majority DCAS, yeah, well, okay. the three DCAS, <laughs> and then the rest of the three staff and other four workers HRA. Yeah. Okay, got it. Super helpful. Um, and thank you. Our staff just received the updated report uh, <laughs> that you referred to Things earlier. Things we accomplished in hearing. Yeah. It's amazing, it's amazing. <laughs> Could you clarify in what ways this report is updated from the previously submitted reports? Any big flags, any things that, any things that we can kind of anticipate? It's a hundred plus, well not hundred, hundreds, 500 uh, page report, so we're gonna take some time to review it. Uh, but anything that we can anticipate that are important to highlight today? Um, I would just say, and I don't know if, Anne, you recall off the top of your head some of the things. I don't think there were flags. I think it was us going back in with like a fine tooth comb with ops to see that we were being as responsive as we could and pushing agencies to have plans that were robust but with meetable goals, recognizing that they just have this year to implement. So are they at least meeting the bare minimums of what the the law requires and then are there ways to build on that that we think that they can get to and so it was a, it was more of that of making some of those adjustments where we thought ah you're not quite where we want you to be um, and giving some of that feedback I don't know if you want to give anything specific yeah I think there were a few agencies that had perhaps missed a particular requirement or two of what they should be including in their plans like ensuring that they have an emergency preparedness plan or having considered plain language principles, sort of elements like that. So they were included to have that. So updates mean better <laughs> reports from agencies and filling in some of the holes. Yes. That's what we can anticipate yes. from this update. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, we have, we have uh, Councilmember Eugene who's joined us as well. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Eugene. Councilmember Yeager for first question, second question, Councilmember Powers, or second member. Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, I'm honored to serve on both committees with you. Uh, Commissioner, I, I have a question about uh, the DOT's expansion beyond the uh, 10 languages required under local law. It seems that they've translated into eight additional language, mm -hmm. uh, uh, languages, something that I applaud. Um, I'm fascinated by it because I consider in the city of New York the DOT to be perhaps the biggest failure of any city agency in the entire city. I think nothing they do is right. Uh, and on this particular item, they happen to have gotten it right to the exclusion, it seems, of any other agency. Um, and I'm curious by what standard uh, they've come to the conclusion that they needed an additional eight languages beyond uh, the, the 10 required and why other agencies have not necessarily come to that uh, same conclusion. So, um, you know, all of the agencies were encouraged beyond the 10 to apply the, D the Department of Justice's kind of four factors in thinking about what language access should look like for them. So looking at the population that they're serving or not, looking at their own resources, et cetera. Um, 
Again, agencies are all at different levels of, of language access. Some have already been doing it for years. Some are just beginning. Um, the Department of Transportation, um, I think in the application of those four additional factors came back and said, we think that we are serving people who speak limited English, more limited English proficient uh, speakers based on census data, our census data and the way that we've applied it to what we're doing. And so this is our recommendation and certainly from our perspective, if they're able to, if they have the resources to go beyond and they've done that analysis, we, we, we're deferring to them on doing more. Do you believe that there are other agencies that are, that should be, I, I hate to say this, perhaps taking a lead from DOT and I really don't want any agency in the city to get the message that they should take a, a lead from DOT on anything with the limited exception of perhaps expanding access to languages? You know, I think every agency, um, without feeling too redundant, is at a different place. I think they've all made great progress. I think we're seeing that in terms of even the dollar expenditures already without full implementation. Um, and it really, in, in many ways, depends on the agency, the nature of their the, the work that they're doing and um, the uh, analysis that they're doing. And so would, you, would I say yes? Like, could other well, what agencies can we, What can we on? do to get other agencies to identify other agencies that, I mean, DOT interacts with the community, sure, but there are many agencies uh, that have similar interactions on a regular basis with, with the communities yeah. at large. And, you know, for example, they're, they're doing Hebrew, Punjabi, I mean, it, languages that, that are perhaps limited to very localized areas in New York City, sure. but they're, they're doing a good job to make that, again, just on this, but they're doing a good job, and there have to be other agencies that have that similar interaction with the community that are not getting there, and what can we do, what can you do, what, can, what does the city council need to do, what does your agency need to do yeah. uh, to make that happen, if anything, unless yeah. you think it's just happening already and we need to just wait for it. You know, I would too. just, sure, I would say a few things. I would say, um, you know, we talked about how robust local authority itself is, so, if you're doing the translation in the, t in the 10 required by the law, you're already meeting 86% of limited English proficient New Yorkers. That doesn't even account for interpretation. Our interpretation goes beyond the 100 required by the law. It goes to up to 200 languages that people can, can provide, and that inc that's included in our signage. Other agencies and programs have gone well beyond these requirements, with, from IDNYC to paid sick leave um, to others have done translations in 20 languages plus. So I think there's a lot of best practices and, and uh, different programs or different agencies that are leading in different ways. Part of our goal is to get everybody up to what we think should be the bare minimum standard and then build on that. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Yeager, Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Very impressive. Three languages? Yes. In the beginning. A little bit of Arabic. Shui shui Arabi, but yeah. Pretty good. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to do, I'm the Chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. I want to just ask about some compliance around the Department of Corrections. Just for starters, can you tell us if they're in compliance with the local laws around language access? Um, so similarly, I would say the Department of Corrections is one where we have some updates and support that we've been doing, but don't have the full uh, vantage point into their compliance until we get the reporting back. Got it. And I, I think our staff noted that their website didn't have their plan on it. Is there any effort so to try to... they one we will follow up on. Okay. Appreciate <laughs> it. I mean, the, the reason I raise is because of, of all the agencies, the one to, if you have a language, I mean, a lot that it matters for, but certainly it's one where you, that's unique relative to other agencies and would certainly, um, do you know if the, in, the inmate handbook is translated into other languages and if so, what languages? So they're in the process of identifying the documents that they've translated. I don't know if, Anne, you know for certain that they've identified that. No, but we can get back to you. And that would be identifying it to know if it's a, like a critical essential yes. document? I would admit, I would make the case that the inmate handbook is, is definitely one because it's often referred to and has all the rights yep. of it. So if it's not, I would certainly encourage it to be included. Okay. But also I think it's important that it's it's translated into as many languages as, as, as we uh, 
as we can get it into because of the uniqueness of the of the system we're talking about and and importance to yeah. the person that's um, there. Um, do we do you know um, um, when when do you anticipate you'll have more information about the DOC in terms of their their uh, so on those two questions, we can try to get back to you shortly. We can reach out to DOT over DOC yes, overarchingly. Um, as I noted, we're working with the agencies on the reporting requirements um, on where they're at with implementation in um, for the beginning of the new year, and we're we're required to report to council on that by middle of next year. And, and do you know um, any information on like? language translation, like like having translators in, in, in like any of the jail facilities in case, in addition to the handbook and other materials, whether somebody actually needs to be. Interpretation, Yeah, you interpretation, mean? yeah. I believe that DOC also um, utilizes the interpretation contracts, but we can confirm that for you as well. Okay, appreciate it. I would, I would, I'll follow up with them as well to, to get more information, but I appreciate if we could sure. maybe work on that together. Yep. And in light of everything that we're talking about in criminal justice right now, certainly one part of it could be yeah. ensuring that everybody has a sort of a clear sense of right. rights, rights and information. So yep. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Councilmember Drum. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask some questions about the Department of Education. Sure. And uh, does the Department of Education's DOE's uh, language uh, access efforts, uh, um, um, how do they match up with local law authority? So um, what I would say is their, their efforts in many ways go beyond local law authority in that they have their own interpretation and translation unit. Um, so that unit is, is greatly robust and it works across the DOE system where the majority of schools um, actually have, um, or sorry, I should say that DOE implemented plans to expand the level of management and training at the schools, um, which we think is great in terms and a huge uh, kind of growth in the work that they're doing. Um, additionally, they have field access coordinators that do this work, so similar in the thinking around the, the coordinators and the training. Um, they, they go, um, they provide translation in, to in the top nine languages, um, but they go above in the same way around interpretation. Um, I'm not sure that we know, and I don't know if Anne, you, you do, how they select the documents um, that they translate, um, but we know they do the telephonic in up to the 200, they do the translation in what they're sending home and giving to students in the nine. Um, they actually join our convenings even though they're not uh, required to under the local law, so they have been a partner that's come to the table in talking through and thinking about best practices, um, and we look forward to continuing to do that work with them. And what about parent-teacher conferences? Do um, they provide translation at all those conferences? I don't know the answer to that, but we can get back to you. Uh -huh. Of course, you know, sometimes they have the um, evening parent-teacher conferences, where I have seen in the past some translators um, available, um, but only like in certain languages, so they don't have them in the necessary languages that they would need for all of the parents to participate. But then it, the DOE also now, the teachers, do have an afternoon that is devoted to um, meeting with parents, I believe. One afternoon a week is devoted to uh, professional development, the other one is devoted to working with parents. So. It would be good if you could look into that also. Sure. I, I think probably the language line is available for that type of a situation. Right. But um, when you're having the one-on-one -on -one conferences, I think it's really important. And actually, it draws parents in to the school when they know that somebody is there who can do those translations. Yeah, we can follow up with you on what they provide there. And I think as noted, you're right. They probably um, tell folks that they can rely on the, the language line interpretation. And have you heard of any um, limitations with the Department of Education? Has any complaints, have any complaints come to you? Um, no, I think honestly getting kind of uh, on the ground feedback more readily coming to us is a goal of ours. We did establish um, the ability for people to call 311 and register a language access complaint, so that does come to us. 
Um, but that's not, I think, where the majority of the issues or concerns are permeating. We, we probably hear more, more of that from the communities that we're engaged with. So also if there's a way to think about how to best share out with council members' offices to direct things to us so that we have awareness, we should think, we'd love to partner with you and think about that. So in the case that Councilmember Menchaca mentioned in his opening statement, um, where the parent um, received a limited access letter. Limited access letter denies a parent access to the school for some alleged reason, mm -hmm. um, and to violate that um, could result in the arrest of the parent. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's what happened in this case or not, but um, what role do you play in, in that at all, if you have any role in that? Um, and I wonder also if you know anything about um, suspension hearings or anything like that when the DOE holds those types of hearings. Um, so again, because DOE is not actually covered under us, we don't have the direct oversight authority, but DOE has never not engaged us on this issue or any others related to the needs of immigrant families. So. Um, I think just readily we would see our office as one that would certainly work with and follow up with DOE to address the issue, not just for the individual family, but overarching system, systematically. Um, and can be, get back to you on the suspension hearings and what they do in terms of interpretation there. And then let me just point out one other area too. I think when um, parents come in for IEP interviews, mm. uh, it's critically important that there be language access available for that also. So they actually started a pilot on that. Um, so there's a new pilot where the, um, uh, a new pub, uh, pilot this year that they're starting in school on IEP. So hopefully we'll get good uh, feedback on what's working with that and be able to expand it more broadly. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. And before I hand it over to Councilmember or Chair Cabrera, uh, I want to follow up on the DOE piece that really kind of speaks to this um, kind of larger conversation about Local Law 30 and its ability. Uh, we we are uh, we are limited in ourselves and how to how to legislate policy here. And so, what we're looking for from you today is, is what's the leadership here and the question around that gap of mm -hmm. local law compliance and what can we do to think about your role uh, for all agencies as the mayor's office, uh, which is under, um, DOE is under, mm -hmm. essentially. And so tell us a little bit about that. The case is under still investigation uh, at, at, at the school and, and Councilmember Drum's question is, is a good one about what role do you play, even if, if officially, technically, the, the compliance isn't there to compel you to do that. Um, what's, what's, the, what's the drive, the leadership, the, the goal, the mission that, that you, you've been speaking to about, about that gap? Yeah, so like I said, predating Local Law 30, we started to bring agencies together and DOE was at that table um, and has continued to be at that table and in conversations with us around this work. They are certainly one of the agencies because they've had the breadth of experience that they do, um, that have shared for, with other agencies and with us some best practices around this work. So, you know, from a sort of sheer kind of um, collegial responsiveness to us, I would say DOE is doing that. Um, and they've, they've done nothing short of being responsive to our concerns around these issues. I think um, it's helpful to hear the specific questions so that we can be even more direct and targeted in what we're, we're trying to address. Um, but they've always been responsive and certainly Chan Chancellor Carranza has a, a deep commitment to ensuring that he's effectively um, serving and working with immigrant families. Uh, okay, I wanna move out of DOE, but I, I will say that um, I wanna invite Moya into the conversation around that parent. It's a, it's a great yeah. case yeah. for us to solve yes. together. Yeah. Um, and then, well, I'll save the rest for, for our next set of questions. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So we have a few more questions. Uh, and feel free to give us the parsimonious, concise okay, uh, version because uh, there are a few that uh, we really need answers for. So the four newly added languages are particularly absent from some 
implementations, would you agree that agencies are required to provide such translation in all of the designated languages? Yes. Okay. Um, several agencies required by law have identified LEP populations that heavily use their services but do not speak a language cover under local law 30. However, some of these agencies do not also detail a plan to ensure that those individuals have any services and information provided to them in their languages. So I have three questions related to that. Do you believe that is compliant with local law 30? Have you established any baseline or standard for which such, such agencies should be required to provide services or translations in languages heavily represented in their service population? And third, are you reviewing data on agency service population to identify such communities as well? Sure. Um, so I think as I noted previously, I'll, and again, we'll be concise. Um, the, the goal for us is to get everybody at that, that minimum standard. And as I noted, with the top 10, which is expanding four languages in a very short amount of time for a lot of agencies or doing this work for the first time for many other agencies, getting everybody to do that and do that effectively has been the focus of the plans and, and the goals and the work with the agencies. We have, as the law requires, and also we've encouraged agencies to do their own four-part analysis um, around who they're serving, what might gaps look like, and how might they be able to meet those. I think they're just, on, to be perfectly honest, at different levels um, of their ability to kind of get to the top 10 effectively and then go beyond it. So while DOT is ready and able to go beyond it, other agencies might not yet be there. What we have encouraged is that the signage be made available for interpretation and that is available well beyond the top 10, right? 200 languages. Mm -hmm. Also, Moya has often served um, as an agency where people might come to us, right, and ask us specific questions. Hey, should I be doing this translation for this particular um, issue or what have you? Is it important to this population? And we will give sort of feedback and advice on that. Uh, so now let me um, just change gears briefly here to uh, regarding outreach to underserved language, underserved uh, language uh, communities. All right, if you could please describe the outreach Moria has and will be conducting for non-designated language community as required by law. Sure. So. Um, the way that we've tackled this is largely identifying populations that are not um, designated or are underserved who um, we haven't, frankly, robustly engaged as a city across agencies. Um, and what we've been doing with those populations is working on the ground with community partners um, who serve the populations. As by way of example, I mentioned the work that we've been doing with the Afghan community in Dari and Pashto and we've been working closely with women for Afghan women around that work, um, w sort of building out a series of conversations with the community where we're providing interpretation or the organization is helping us facilitate the communication, understanding the needs of the population um, that are most pressing, um, and then from those needs, building out larger forums for the community that have the, the live interpretation and have materials present that are translated in the documents that were most requested or the information that was most requested. So that's been the way we've been approaching it, largely to not just try to hit every community, but to like really dive deeply um, and be responsive in an effective way. Um, and then from those forums, we, do, we continue to do follow up that the agencies are a part of on the key issues. So sometimes that entails the translation of a document. For example, for that one, IDNYC was a big thing. We actually hadn't translated our applications into those languages, so we did for the first time um, as a part of this process. Um, so that's the kind of work we'll continue to do. And you have the staff capacity to expand? Um, so we will continue to monitor um, sort of what our needs are in this respect, but this is a focus of what we've been doing. Okay, this sounds like a tremendous amount of work. 
uh, to accomplish that. Uh, Moya conducted the first ever, ever Af Afghan town hall in Pashto and Dari. Uh, uh, what resulted uh, from that town hall? Were any services, programs, or documents identified as being uh, critical uh, to those communities? Were any additional services or documents now be available in either language? So um, I can speak generally. I mentioned the IDNYC one. Additional, I have a belief for that one, a big one was housing needs um, and kind of public assistance access. So we brought in partners to those conversations who have remained um, working with the community organizations and taking the individual community needs for follow-up. Uh, along those lines, uh, what other measurable outcomes have resulted from town halls or outreach conducted by Moya? Um, so, measurable outcomes, I can't speak right now to individual cases that we, were, we addressed or were responsive to. Um, the, really, the town hall itself is a outcome, to be perfectly honest. So, as I said, there's a series of engagements that we do that lead up to that, where we've brought the agencies that speak to the issues that the community has raised to us as central to their needs. So. Um, I would say twofold. Sometimes it's resulted in document translation. Um, sometimes it's resulted in individual case assistance. Um, in all cases, it's resulted in sort of the know your rights sharing in the language that the community speaks. My last question before I turn it over uh, to my co-chair. Has Moya developed plans on how agencies should adapt when the list of designated citywide languages changes as city demographics mm -hmm. shift? That's a good question. Um, so as the law requires, we are to do an analysis every three years of, of the designated languages. Um, we have not thought about sort of uh, in three years from now what that will look like in terms of shifts. I would say part of what will inform that for us is how people have implemented this this year's laws and what challenges there were in doing that implementation and the where the gaps are, I would imagine just based on migration patterns that you won't see dramatic changes. So it'll be less of a lift for agencies. Maybe it's one or two language changes, but probably not beyond that. So mm -hmm. arguably a hope is that because they've already gotten accustomed to doing the translation in maybe one of the languages, if it switches, they'll keep doing that and just add another. Um, but that's part of the goal too, right, is institutionalizing the way you do language services work and access and making it so that it's just a part of the daily thinking of operations. I'm curious, uh, what, what demographics data do you rely upon to make this decision? Is there a particular city uh, wide, is it federal, state? Sure, and this was part of a um, conversation with council as we were looking at the establishment of local law 30. Um, the city has traditionally relied on census data to determine the top 10 languages. What we wanted to be able to do was in going beyond the six, look at uh, data that changes more frequently. Um, where we, What we decided to do was actually look at DOE data as a result of that. So in looking at the four additional um, languages, the Department of Education actually collects of their, you know, over a uh, million households, the preferred languages, um, and that is ever-changing um, from a year-to-year -year basis, so it is the most kind of up-to-date, tangible data that we can look at, whereas census is, as you know, um, every 10 years. So that's been the thinking of why we married the two. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over now to my co-chair. Thank you, co-chair, and uh, I have some questions around uh, Chinese language access, DYCD and ACS. So we'll start with Chinese language access. Um, the language access plans that were reviewed by the staff across, across the board vary significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you spoke a lot to the getting everyone to the base, the mm -hmm. foundation, and then, and then moving up. Uh, in, their agents, in these agency approaches, uh, they do offer some Chinese language support. This is especially concerning though, as Chinese is the umbrella term for multiple dialects. You have Mandarin, Cantonese, Fujianese, etc., And then you have two different written scripts 
the simplified and the traditional. Uh, in my in my district, you have um, uh, uh, so many different. Um, probably all of these are significant in in the community, and even for one district office uh, with limited resources, it's a difficult thing. So this is what we deal with on a daily basis when we think about participatory budgeting and maintaining our our commitment to that really po powerful um, initiative. What guidance has Moya provided to agencies regarding Chinese language provisions uh, for the different languages in Britain? Uh, what sure. have you What have you provided? So we have provided guidance on this that we've not made it mandatory to date, which is something that we're thinking about. Um, the guidance. Wait, that so repi re repeat that again. I didn't we have you have we provided? have provided guidance, but not you must do. Oh, I see. Right? Just guidance. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, based on research that we've done, um, conversations with communities and others, we believe that the best practice is in terms of translation, simplified Chinese. Um, and How did you come up with that? Based on, honestly, re a lot of research, looking at migration patterns, looking at uh, speaking directly to community-based uh, organizations and kind of understanding that what we were gathering or garnering from the research and the data was accurate to the experiences of communities on the ground, um, making simplified Chinese the recommendation on a best practice that we've given um, agencies, and that's what we do. Um, in terms of interpretation, that is available in, in the different, um, from Mandarin to Cantonese to Fujinese and others through the telephonic interpretation. Um, so that shouldn't be a limitation. Um, some agencies, um, specifically the Department of Social Services, in their doing their own kind of four-factor analysis, determined, no, it's valuable for us to do both simplified and traditional Chinese, so they're doing both. Um, and so I think that's an ongoing thing to be looking at and understanding what makes sense kind of overarchingly and then what should be added. And what's preventing you from moving from guidance to kind of regs through, through the process that you've, you've taken on for Moya for other agencies? Um, mostly, I think it's it's that most of the agencies are doing what we've <laughs> recommended as the best practice. And do you have that? And I don't remember that being one of the things in the report that show that kind of, again, they vary. They clearly vary. There's still some goal, uh, gaps. And maybe the updated uh, analysis that we just got today will kind of show us getting there. But um, if you were able to kind of grade in general across the board, are people, are most people meeting that guidance that you've given them? Um, I can't, I don't remember off the top of my head if okay. they're doing that. I think we'll, we'll also see from the reporting period what they ended up doing. But I think in terms of when we say Chinese translation, we mean simplified chi Chinese. That's something for us to think about in mm. moving forward. Okay. Uh, are, are you working with other municipalities to get best practices from them? And if you are, which ones? Um, on language access specifically, we have worked with other municipalities. I'm trying to jog my memory on whether or not, like, to, not to, um, you know, throw a sister. Yes, we are the best. The we yeah. are the best. I, I know we are the best. It's like the second best, though, right? And that's, that's a lot. We are often doing just a tremendous amount more um, than cities across the country. We have engaged um, some cities just to understand what they're doing, including Boston, Philly, and San Francisco. Um, who do this work. We actually had a convening through our coalition, Cities for Action, maybe earlier this year, and um, one of the conversations was around um, starting offices of immigrant affairs and language access being at the core of our recommendation for what people should be thinking about in that work. Wonderful. It's really exciting that we can kind of share that with other cities. Uh, and then finally, on the Chinese language access, um, questions, are you aware of any major complaints from agencies or from people uh, with unfulfilled requests for translation around Chinese? Uh, and I just really kind of thinking about individuals in, in our service community or, or being serviced by our agencies, mm -hmm. are you aware of any kind of big major complaints? 
I'm not, though I, know, I, I made note that there are a couple organizations here to testify, so we'll be sure to grab their testimonies to see Good. if there's something okay. we haven't missed. Awesome. Let's move over to the DYCD language access question. And at a joint hearing that we had uh, both with Immigration and Youth Service Committee on September 17th of this year, DYCD said that they were not considered a covered agency under Local Law 30 because most of their services are provided through contracted entities. However, DYCD does provide at least one direct public service through its Youth Connect hotline, just as 311's phone line is covered by this law. Would you agree that DYCD should also be covered, even if it's just the Youth Connect hotline? Um, so yes, on that front. Um, okay. So we have talked to uh, DYCD. Um, they have talked to us about what their plans are in this regard. They have designated a language access coordinator. They are working on a plan um, for themselves. They'll be joining our conversations and convenings on Youth Connect. They actually have telephonic interpretation contract in place, um, and they have um, translated their materials or are working on that in the 10 languages. Okay, so it sounds like they're, they're trying to comply as much as they can. Yes. Okay, and great, and that'll be probably be part of the report that is coming as well, I'm assuming. Sorry? Would that, be, would that be inserted into the report, the updated report that we're getting? Do you know if that's in there? The, the DYCD. Yeah, it's not in it's the not, updated yeah. report that, you, rece that okay. you received, but they are working on the plan to incorporate in it. Got it, so we'll be expecting it. ACS uh, has 193 complaints according to the report uh, you all just submitted, or not, or not just maybe, but before submitted. This number stood out significantly to us. Could you tell us a little bit about any of the co uh, commonalities that come out of those complaints and how you are working with ACS to improve their language access services? Yeah, I was just conferring with Anne. I don't think we know the specifics of commonalities amongst those complaints. Okay, well we wanna work with you to. Because sure. uh, I, I think we, we saw that as, as, a, as a real flag yeah. at that number. Uh, and we know that complaints like this, one comes out and it really represents a larger number that might not have ever gotten there uh, in the first place. Mm -hmm. And uh, Councilmember Joni and Councilmember Holden have questions. Uh, Councilmember Holden first. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner, for the testimony. I just want to, um, who's checking the translation? Uh, some months back, I walked in with a Chinese translator, just so happened to be with him in the Department of Buildings in Queens. And there were pamphlets piled on um, the desk, many languages. He looked at the Chinese uh, uh, pamphlet. He said, this is totally wrong. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. Um, it was misleading, actually. Um, does somebody, because he pointed it out to the DOB, and he said, you shouldn't give these out. Uh, and he does this professionally. He does this uh, um, uh, for a living. So. Who, who checks the translation um, for, for agencies? So thank you for the question. I think this is one area of ongoing challenge that we're looking to try and improve um, for a couple of things. One is uh, we, we believe part of why the, the translations don't always um, come out as effectively and accurately as we would like them to is because of the way the agencies are working with the vendors. Um, part of that is what they're giving the vendor to translate. Is it really in as much plain language as possible to avoid confusion around the nuance and the intention of the, of the document? Um, and um, how to talk to the agency about what you're looking for, et cetera. We are, as I said, um, in November, bringing the agencies together for another convening. This is exactly the focus of that because it's been an ongoing issue. Um, an additional way we're trying to address this is um, through, frankly, piloting a best practice. So we, for the first time this year, um, entered into a contract with a third vendor um, that we're giving our translated documents to for a third party review. In the absence of that contract, we've recommended that agencies can use the Volunteer Language Bank um, as well for a third party review, but these are some of the ways we're trying to address it and recognize it's an ongoing area of work. Yeah, it just seemed a tremendous waste when you see thousands yes. of pamphlets uh, and they're wrong. And they, I, we, he said, yep. don't give these out because they're totally misleading. 
Um, second thing, I have a large Albanian population mm -hmm. um, in, in my district, and I, I think you know we need more um, communication there. Mm -hmm. Can I, if, if I speak to your office and we need some special communications in a certain area, whether it be housing, you, could, you can actually um, get some things printed possibly, or at least... We could um, certainly try, yes. Yes, because yes. we do have to do, do some outreach, I know. Yeah. Councilman John yeah. might say something to that too, but um, we need we we do need more outreach in the communities and, and working with the council members, we if we can identify certain populations that are in need. Um, We'd love uh, to do that. We thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember Yeager. Jonah, you're next. Sorry, you're all over there. The, 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 the other Albanian. Not you're, Yeager, you're not Jonah. the same. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and just to piggyback on uh, the councilman's uh, question, I know that you're targeting neighborhoods and communities where you're trying to get a better understanding of the needs of the various mm -hmm. ethnicities. Uh, clearly, uh, you can see the difference between DOT and DOJ and um, the assessments that are made on their needs that go further than the 10 recognized languages. What is it that you're doing can be improved upon as we target these ethnic neighborhoods, um, which will continue to expand, uh, and it's not too difficult to understand why. Sure. Uh, but as they immigrate here, uh, obviously they will immigrate to a region where they can speak their own native language and uh, have others that share their same culture and history uh, so they can fit in. What more can be done by your agency? Um, so thank you for the question. So some of some of the uh, communities that we've been looking at being uh, doing sort of that deeper dive into are because people are coming to us and sort of identifying the need, and some of it is our affirmative sort of looking at where there's growth in communities and language need, uh, diversity needs. Um, uh, and some of it is kind of responsive, as we know, to sort of a dearth of information or materials getting to them in their languages. Um, so we lo we love to hear sort of where there are gaps that maybe we have not yet addressed so that we can think about that with you. One of the things that some of the um, programs have done, not necessarily a, an agency-wide best practice, but a program best practice, has been creating brochures that while it might be in a particular language or in certain languages have mention in more languages of the ability to get information in their language by calling X number or visiting the location. Um, so those kinds of expansions are things that we think are best practices that we want organizations to work, agencies to work on. Additionally, if there is uh, a particular document or area where you see this is, you know, I'm, this is what we're constantly hearing as a gap or an area where there's gaps. We can certainly work with the agencies to make sure that we're meeting that. Um, I think we're mindful of, um, as I said, how robust, how quickly we're asking the agencies to go in terms of the translation. Um, but certainly, if it if we can be narrow and specific on where it makes sense to go beyond, and that reflects what they're seeing in terms of their service delivery, there's there's good opportunity there to build on that so, work. Not, not to cut you off, but why aren't we focusing on a real micro level like the community boards, for example, that could be very helpful in defining the neighborhoods and the various ethnicities and pockets that exist? I, I mean, we, we do that work through our own data analysis. So we definitely have a sense of where we, where we need to be and um, what languages people speak through our own work. I think, um, I, as I noted, you, what you're talking about is sort of individual questions that are coming to you in terms of needs, and maybe community boards are another good place to go to for those for that um, awareness. But we often work with community-based organizations that serve the populations to make sure that we're hearing kind of what are their what are the continuous questions or concerns that their communities are facing. So welcome ideas, if, and community boards are one we can follow up on. Well, if we took the approach of using the feedback from community boards mm -hmm. that would determine or could more specific decide the ethnicities in a particular neighborhood where you can be more aggressive instead of waiting for some of these ethnic some of these 
ethnic groups don't even have recognized organizations. Mm -hmm. That's right. So when you're saying we, we, we rely on these ethnic organizations to provide us the information, well, they may not even have an organization that represents them, or they're so widespread that it's sure. difficult to represent their, or bring them together and bring their needs to your attention. I think that's right. The, the one thing I would say is that even in groups that don't have established organizations, for example, the Uzbeki community, we, we, there are established leaders or mosques that they go to or so forth, and they're who we've approached to say, hi, hey, we're interested in, in working with this community and helping to address some of their concerns or, or bring agencies and services to them. And we, if it's not an established organization, we, we have worked to identify leadership within the community and then convene them. So you, I believe you use an example here of uh, we had an Afghani town hall last year, mm -hmm. right? Which led to uh, participation of more than 200 members that brought to your attention their specific needs. What transpired that Afghani town hall? What, what brought that mm -hmm. to fruition? Um, work that we had started to do um, with that community in Queens, um, basically as a part of the work that we do at Moya in trying to ensure that we're, uh, we're speaking to communities across the city. Um, so uh, in that instance, it was working with particular organizations, so Women for Afghan Women being one of them, who we had started to work with, um, and who, as they brought issues to us, you know, we said, you know, this seems like bigger, a larger, there's a larger need here to bring agencies to the community, and that's what led us to that. It's been different in different um, situations. So for, um, as I said, Uzbeki is actually a good example. Nobody came to us. There wasn't an established organization. We met with Uzbeki leaders that had been identified and began conversations and then continue to build on that work towards doing engagements with them. Um, there's no community center or organization, but at the mosque where many go to and so forth. Great, so let me introduce myself. Councilman Mark Jonai, the only Albanian elected in the state of New York. I need your help. We have an Albanian community that is completely underserved and off the radar um, that is having a very difficult time navigating through the different agencies and departments within the city. There's a real need there. Yeah. And, um, and there's many other ethnicities that are going through the yes, same issues. Of so I'm looking forward to working with you Thank on you. this great. and many other issues. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councilmember Jonai. We have two quick follow-ups on the DYCD sure. questions, and then we want to hear from the advocates as well. Thank you so much for your patience. We want to hear your voice as well. And I'm uh, we're expecting that Moya staff will be here as well. Okay, so earlier you testified at, at the very beginning about the compliance for Local Law 30, um, and we found a gap in the uh, DYCD piece that's on its way, and which is not right now and currently covered. And so we want to find out if there are other agencies that should be covered, even if most of their services might not be covered by the law. Uh, and will you commit to a review to identify such agencies? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Easy. Thank you. Do you believe that it would be beneficial to extend our language access requirements to entities who provide direct public services paid for by the City of New York pursuant to a contract with a city agency? Um, so we're certainly um, open to conversations about that. I think that... Um, I would say that for awareness that a, uh, HRA, I believe, already does this um, in many respects pursuant to Executive Order 70, Local Law 73, not Executive Order 73. Um, I think this is, um, you know, uh, a place of conversation. I would also just note the obvious, a place of resources. <laughs> And I love that question about resources, <laughs> you know that. And so I'm hoping that we can, can anticipate that as we move forward and ask for those resources because that's what we do. We, we approve the budget, you all pr present it, you're the mayor's office, so you present it, uh, and so we'd like to see some of this anticipated, addressed, so that we can be so happy to say, yes, we got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
thank you for, for coming and testifying. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold for two seconds. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you so much. Okay, and with that, we'll have, uh, and thank you, Commissioner, thank you so much again, muchas gracias. Uh, with that, we'll have our next panel, and we wanna thank this next panel because they were uh, instrumental uh, and they provided leadership uh, in shaping Local Law 30. <clears throat> and so we'll ask Persephone Tam from the Asian American Federation, Matmuna Diaye from African Communities Together, Betsy Plume for New York Immigration Coalition, Sabrina Jalal from CAV, and Sylvia Sik, uh, Sik Day from India Home. And you can begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you, Chair Menchaca and Chair Cabrera and the committees on governmental operations and immigration for convening this hearing today. I am Persephone Tan, Associate Director of Immigration and Policy at the Asian American Federation. First, we thank the City Council for passing this law last year and to continue working with Moya and other city agencies to protect the rights of immigrant and limited English proficient New Yorkers. In December of 2016, the Federation joined the New York Immigration Coalition and African Communities together to advocate for an updated citywide language access policy. As leadership organizations for African Asian and all immigrant New Yorkers, we understand the dire language needs of our very diverse communities. Through our members and partners, we recognize the urgency in securing language accessibility so that New York's most vulnerable populations are able to access public services. For the Asian immigrant community, the Department of Education tracks 55 languages across more than 20 Asian ethnic groups. The solidarity shown across our three organizations prompted the New York City Council to unanimously approve an additional four languages to include Arabic, French, Polish, and Urdu, which will be in part support the growing African, Arab, and Pakistani immigrant populations. This collective advocacy demonstrates our continued commitment in ensuring that the city can meet the demands of its ever-changing demographics. After reviewing Moya's report published in June 2018, we want to fit, uh, raise four concerns. One, there is no clarity or uniformity on which form of Chinese should be used between simplified, simplified Chinese versus traditional Chinese for written and printed material. It is important to identify uh, dialects as well because not only in Chinese, but not everyone is literate and may not have the ability to read written forms in their language. So we recommend that city agencies should identify which Chinese script and dialects are used most often for the people they serve. Hard data on script preferences would be necessary to determine which should be used. Two, according to the report, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene does not have a standardized system of collecting and tracking a client's primary or preferred language. We recommend the that DOHMH should standardize a system or utilize processes that other city agencies put into place in order to identify a client's primary preferred language use. For example, ACS and HRA both use language cards to identify and track this. DIFTA uses another system to track preferred language when they send mail or emails to clients. Moya should regularly evaluate best practices as seen from agency and as seen from agency implementation plans across the board. If this is not already put into place, we recommend that Moya develops a plan to regularly assess and implement this with the, L with the local law 30 corresponding city agencies. Three, we want to know what is the criteria or parameters in which Moya will hold agencies accountable for not providing proficient language access to individuals seeking assistance. 
what is the accountability, accountability measure, mechanism between Moya and the city agencies? We recommend transparency in Moya's corrective action plans to address non-compliance from city agencies who fail to provide adequate and proper language interpretation and translation services. Sufficient funding and resources are necessary to implement their language access plans. Lastly, we are concerned that the 311 reporting system for language access complaints is underutilized as evidenced by the fact that within the first year of Local Law 30 was in effect, there were limited to no complaints made for each agency as stated in the report. Uh, based on anecdotal information from our member agencies, we know that there are many unrecorded examples of unmet language access needs and that the community is unaware of or is unwilling to use the current reporting mechanism through 311. In this case, we recommend that there should be more outreach to the community to build awareness of available of language assistance and inform people of how to register their need through 311. We all know that limited English proficient communities may not be utilizing or know how to call 311. This also exists previous, uh, there also exists previous experiences of individuals who were unable to reach someone who spoke their language when using 311. And uh, as an example from one of our member orgs, uh, 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 Japanese uh, CBO um, mentioned, and I'll just read from their testimony, they're not here today, but I just wanted to indicate one example. Um, one client visited a government agency to apply for public benefits and requested for an interpreter for Japanese. Then the staff at the agency called a Mandarin speaking interpreter. So that's just only one of many examples that exist in which my um, colleagues on this panel will mention. Um, as well, and as the city continues to address uh, the ongoing concerns with language access, uh, such as the ones I just mentioned, uh, we look forward to working with the city council, Moya, and other city agencies to address language access needs for um, New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. And a quick thing about the panel, so we can move the panel forward. If there are things that we can focus on that have not been, uh, we want to get some specific concepts. Uh, so that we can send, uh, spend some time on Q&A as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Committee on Governmental Operations and Committee of Immigration and Council Members. My name is Maimune Jay, Program Manager at African Communities Together, ACT. At ACT, I lead our Community Interpreter Program and supervise the development of um, African, and supervise the development of Language Services Worker Cooperative. So ACT is an organization of African immigrants that empowers our, our community members to integrate socially, get ahead economically, and engage civically. On behalf of ACT, I would like to applaud the city's major accomplishment in the local law 30 of 2017. First, in recognizing that New York is one of the most diverse cities in the country, and much of its population speaks languages other than English. And second, in expanding the language access to French and Arabic and in providing enforcement provisions in the new law, Many of the communities we serve at ACT are West African immigrants who speak in addition to their native languages, French. So this language um, access expansion means that now about uh, 2,000 mo two, 2, more Africans can access services in, um, in, the, in the city in French. Although the local law 30 is a great start to language access, it does not cover all African immigrants. As you may know, many Africans who are from Francophone countries can communicate most effectively in their native languages instead of, instead of French. This is because um, French is widely spoken by Africans who have access to higher education. With an increase of African immigrants from coming from different economic and educational backgrounds in New York City, we are faced with two major concerns that the local law 30 bill did not address. So the first one being um, the challenge of, com of uh, our that our community members face in finding interpreters in African languages uh, other than French in city agencies. And our office often received calls from um, our new immigrant community members who, who were unable to access city services because they were not able to co communicate with the, with the city agencies. Um, and I'll give you an example of a person who um, ca came from Mali and she didn't have access to education. So she called one of our staff members to uh, communicate with her in um, 
she went to the HR office after she was granted her uh, asylee to get uh, benefits, but she wasn't able to communicate and no one was there to assist her. Um, so she decided to call a staff member in our office who speaks Mandingo um, to communicate um, so that she was able to access services. So a number of, uh, like, and that's just one case out of many, and so a number of our staff would receive call uh, asking about interpretation. And so the second one is the ina inadequacy in telephonic interpretation and its inferiority in building connection and trust between the interpreter and the client. And also, um, especially in sensitive issues like health and domestic violence. And the other one is in its quality and availability for languages with regional uh, variations like Mandingo, just like um, Persephone mentioned just uh, now um, for ch the Chinese language. So I'm here on behalf of my community to ask the city to hire in key offices bilingual frontline staff who can serve as navigators and facilitators in accessing languages that the clients speak and in connecting them to the right interpreter. Um, the second one is to consider investing in the establishment of a community legal interpreter bank, a model that the District of Columbia has successfully used, um, which consists of a group of professional inter interpreters and translators who are recruited and trained to provide language access services free of cost to qualified nonprofit organizations that serve low income individuals. We advise the city to consider um, em emulating this model of language services. Language access. So ACT is in the process of incubating an African language services worker cooperative, which will be a worker run agency that provides in person interpretation, translation, um, language instruction in African, of African languages and ESL for new immigrants. So the city council has invested in worker owned cooperative and ACT, Asian American Federation and New York Immigration Coalition believe that the city should support language services cooperative development in that language services co-op can meet two of the city goals, um, which consists of language access and economic development. So the community-based language services worker co-op can work in a complementary fashion by building the supply of interpreters and languages of, of limited diffusion, including many, a many African, Asian, and indigenous <laughs> Latin American languages. We, get, we again sal salute the city's effort in recognizing effective language access as the cornerstone of equity in this beautiful and diverse city that we live in. But we, we call all of you to remember the, that fairness is, is not existent if some people are left out. In this case, we have to extend language services to the people who do not speak the 10 designated citywide languages. Thank you for your valuable time and con consideration in implementing our recommendations. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you to the Government Operations Committee and the Immigration Committee for convening today's hearing and to the entire City Council for your continued leadership on behalf of New York City's immigrant communities. My name is Betsy Plum and I'm the Vice President of Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. The NYC was proud to partner with our New York City members last year to push for the passage of Local Law 30. Local Law 30's codification and expansion of the city's language access protections has ensured that our diverse communities can come closer to language equity while having greater access to the city's vital services. Today, we want to use the opportunity to underscore the need to see Local Law 30 as just the start to our city's robust response to language access needs and offer ways that the City Council and Mayor de Blasio's administration can better support immigrant New Yorkers navigate our city and its services, a need that is all the more vital given the hate and hostility that's transmitting from our federal government. In our city, three out of every five residents are an immigrant or the child of an immigrant, and nearly one out of every four immigrants is limited English proficient. Offering immigrants and their families the tools they need to meaningfully navigate our city is vital. Increasing the number of languages to 10 that city agencies must translate their most commonly distributed documents into was a critical step forward. However, we live in a city where more than 176 languages are spoken in our schools, where Queens is home to more than 138 language speakers, and where an estimated over 800 languages are spoken. I think we can all agree 10 mandated languages by city law should only be the beginning. There are also unique concerns that we have with the standing implementation of Local Law 30. Much of this has been mentioned by my colleagues, but I want to underscore that there are numerous distinct dialects and regional variations even within the top 10 languages. 
Similarly, as mentioned, for a language like Chinese, beyond distinct dialects, there are different ways to write the language. The city has enacted a number of measures to gather and maintain stronger data on users of city agencies, and it would be extremely helpful to use the data to understand which versions, dialects, or variation of a language, both written and spoken, are most necessary, understanding that this may vary in different parts of the city and for different agencies. Moreover, if the data does not tell us these things, we need to be developing improved data gathering tools and methods. We are also concerned with the current mechanisms for reporting complaints or violations to the city's language access protections and the ripple effect that this then has for ensuring agencies are being held accountable and Local Law 30 is being enforced. To date, advocates have been instructed that 311 is the best way to register complaints. However, there is little, if any, visible effort to outreach about using 311 for this purpose or on what 311 is entirely or when and why to use it. More so, if someone is seeking to report a complaint about a language access service provided or the quality of services, it is very unlikely that they will see calling a city hotline as a meaningful remedy. This is all the more true when individuals do try to call 311, and these are all based off of real examples, only to be met with the same language access roadblocks that they're calling to complain about. We welcome the opportunity to think through how to create more community-friendly ways to register complaints and how to make 311 a truly inclusive tool for all New Yorkers. As we look toward which true structural improvements in how our city engages with language access, I want to mention two longer-term investments that we would encourage City Council to consider. The first is what Maimuna mentioned around funding worker-led language cooperatives and interpreter banks. These are cooperatives that could actually meet the demand of languages spoken regularly in New York City outside the 10 covered by Local Law 30, including the many African, A Asian, and indigenous native languages that are not included in the law, and that we see agencies needing to provide services in. We've seen these models work in cities like Washington, D.C., and they're able to offer individuals the most culturally and linguistically fluent interpretation and language access possible. My second recommendation would be to fund a true investment in language, English language instruction designed for immigrants with the outcomes that are most relevant for their experience, their lives, and their integration. Currently, English for Speakers of Other Languages ESOL programs are supported by the city's adult education system, which receives funding from the local, state, and federal level, but the system has been chronically underfunded and is increasingly shifted to requiring onerous career and college readiness standards, with the greatest unmet demand in the system for those who speak the lowest levels of English language. Until we as a city take the educational needs of adults seriously, we will continue to need to grapple with a beautiful and diverse immigrant community that cannot meaningfully navigate and contribute to our city simply because of language barriers. We applaud the investments that City Council has made to support English and other adult education programs and encourage a broader investment in this next year to support programming, really seeing the deep connection between language access and limited English proficiency and the ability to learn English. For each of these, as well as our ongoing concerns regarding agency compliance and accountability, we look forward to working as thought partners, but we really are so proud of New York City for taking the critical steps to support language access and are proud to be here today pushing the city to make its best even better. I'm not going to lie, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> Um, and this would be my first testimony, but my name is Sabrina Jalal. I am a public housing organizer at CAB, Organizing Asian Communities. Um, and we organize in Lower East Side as well as Queensbridge, Queens, New York. Um, you know, although Local Law 30 is a great start to um, implementing language access, it doesn't cover all bases. There are more than 400,000 New York New Yorkers living in public housing developments run by New York City NYCHA, I mean, New York City Housing Authority. Um, and for them, NYCHA is property manager, is landlord, and is the super. Uh, NYCHA systems and staffs are the point persons for, inter for interface for repair issues, rental payments, emergency information, and other services. For NYCHA tenants with limited proficiency in English, navigating policies, procedures, and paperwork associated with their housework can be fought with challenges. Issues of language access have serious implications. 
Tenants whose rents are raised incorrectly may be taken to ho housing court for non-payment of rent because they were unable to communicate with NYCHA to resolve the error. Tenants may be forced to miss work because they have to, re they have to schedule repeated meetings in attempt to communicate their needs. Victims of domestic violence who are in need of emerg emergency housing transfers are not able to make that need known. The safety of tenants' apartments can be jeopardized by a lack of language access in repair, access, in repair processes. Crucial housing information such as emergency protocols um, may not reach tenants because they're not translated. Lack of language access Im impacts the day-to-day -day experience of tenants in interaction with NYCHA staff and their ability to participate in meaningful participate meaningfully in the NYCHA community uh, perpetrating isolation. Uh, in 2008, M Mayor Michael Bloomberg um, signed the Executive Order 120, which requires a city agency to ensure meaningful access to direct public services for LEP individuals. While Housing Authority is not exclusively a city agency, NYCHA references Executive Order 120 um, on their website, introducing their language service, language assistance service implementation and it was developed in 2009, shortly after it was uh, on their website. However, NYCHA's um, customer contact center, the CCC line, um, which was previously referred, it's meant to provide residents with one central point of contact for their apartment and develop maintenance needs. However, it's not accessible to all um, our Asian LEP tenants. Many of the tenants have been deterred from calling CCC because they do not think that they can talk to someone in their language, and that's becoming an issue. Um, most of them who call don't get to an interpreter unless they follow through a bunch of steps which are in English, so they have no way of understanding or where to go. Um, NYCHA, it does not proactively provide language access service to LEP tenants during the repair process, and even if they have requested it to be done in a different language. Um, nearly all tenants who have been surveyed were asked to sign a document um, that they can't read, and that's not fair. If you can't read a document, you should not sign it. Um, and while NYCHA contracts with Language Line, a translator vendor to, pro to provide interpretation services for the CCC, tenants first attempt to navigate the number of steps without translation in order to reach the translator. Um, and on the next page, I provided a graph, um, a chart that showed what are the top 10 languages in, in New York City of those spoken at home. And in Queens, you can see that the top Four languages include Spanish, Chinese, Bengali, Korean, and Russian. Although those are top five, it's not implemented in NYCHA's um, CCC services. Uh, yeah. um, there are also some testimonies from members that we have interacted with uh, and show their experience of like pa um, paint lead that's been like coming off and they've had to go to the hospital with their children. Um, but language access issues impact tenants' ability to understand crucial housing matters and it can impact their health, safety, and stability of their housing and their sense of belonging in NYCHA's community. To move forward, NYCHA must provide a system that provides meaningful access to all tenants by ensuring that non-English speakers can successfully navigate the CCC system, dis disseminate information about language access services more widely and ensure that information about available services is shared in language tenants speak and include tenants and community groups as partners in evaluating improved language access services. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sylvia Sigdar and I'm representing India Home. India Home is a nonprofit organization founded by the community members to serve the South Asian older adults. The mission of our organization is to improve the quality of the life of older adults by providing quality care in a culturally appropriate environment. We serve 200 older adults across Queens through senior center programs, case management, recreational activities, and advocacy. I'm here today on behalf of my community. And our community members are very limited in their English proficiency and English language skills. As, as such, our services and other culturally appropriate services that come from the immigrant communities are 
extremely necessary. Moreover, our members feel a greater level of comfort talking to only our staff members and rely on us on the first, on a first and sometimes only point of contact when accessing services. Oftentimes, we have been told by our members that they have reported to the HRA or other city agencies, and when asked for language services, have not received immediately immediate services, and instead have been told to return at a later time to receive the services. Because of this inadequate service, our members resort to asking our staff to accompany them to such appointments and serve as translators. This creates strain on our staff to accompany them to such appointments and serve as uh, time and resources. Furthermore, we are required to have telephonic HIPAA complaint language interpretation services as per DEFTA regulations. But with South Asian languages costing over $1 per minute and appointments taking upward of 30 to 60 minutes, the cost of providing these services can be a financial strain on uh, for a smaller organization like, like our own. Well-meaning languages access plans such as those of NYC Well or DEFTA are not always operational. NYC Well states that it's available in 200 plus languages. And DEFTA language access plans cover to top 10 languages and then uses 3114, 165 other languages. In both instances, many South Asian older adults get left behind. Through experiences of our community members, we found out that South Asian older adults members have reported unsatisfactory experiences when attempting to access services in Kannada, Telugu, Sinhala, Marathi, and other languages, just to name a few languages here. As such, stating that access in available in 170 or 200 languages is incorrect. In other instances, Getting a translator takes too much time and the community members feel frustrated and helpless. All the language access plans are commendable. We recommended further access. To monitor and evaluate the implementation of the language access plan with a focus on laser spoken la languages to, to grant more city contracts to agencies and service providers that come directly from immigrant communities and that hire culturally appropriate and linguistically competent staff to provide direct services. These will ensure a better and increased utilization of government services. And three, and the last one, to give smaller organizations special funding to be able to provide language access lines. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, as you were uh, all, first of all, thank you so much for all the work that you do. Uh, I don't think uh, there's enough time here uh, to, uh, for all of us to just go on and on and express our gratitude uh, for the daily work that you do and you're literally making a difference in people who may find themselves in vulnerable situation due to the language and cultural challenges. Uh, I was very curious to know as, as you were speaking have you ever just happened to call 311 and, and speak in a language other than, than English and see what they do with that? You have? I do have the uh, answer for this because we have South Asian seniors, uh, older adults, who speaks different languages. So. Some of them don't know how to speak English. So I told them like, okay, you can just start calling and tell them you speak, just say about your language. But they were denied like uh, uh, my um, a colleague over here, she says like when a Japanese was, uh, she was needed a Japanese uh, language speaker, right? But she was uh, recommended to wear Mandarin. Like here, my, member, like the client, she was needed like Kannada and that person was given Hindi. She doesn't speak Hindi. So what happened at that point when they were- They cut off the line. They got off the line? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm curious to know what will happen after that uh, and what's, what's the process because I could see, first of all, it's scary enough just making that call. Um, 
And I, I'm just curious to see what would the city do and if there's no, if there's not a system in place, what do you recommend that they should do? Um, I think I can also um, add to what the commissioner had mentioned earlier, which is when there are languages that are not uh, under the designated 10 languages um, that is mandated citywide, then you know they refer to us, uh, the CBOs uh, who do work with the community on a daily basis on the ground. So we recognize, so for example, India Home just mentioned several South Asian languages uh, that even I don't even know what they are, right? And I think it's important for the city to work with us to identify those needs um, in terms of um, how to implement it. If a client is unable to call 311 and they decide to hang up, they will probably call one of us to make that call for them. So it is a reliance on uh, knowing ex exactly who can provide those services. If it's not the city, then it would be nonprofits such as ours. Um, and many of our um, groups have a lot of members and partners under us uh, who, you know, who provide these daily services to the community. Yeah, but I'm curious if, if I'm the 311 operator and I have no idea where even to begin, what should be the next step? You know what I mean? Like, if I don't even know if it's even within this realm of languages, uh, what happens at that point? And I would imagine that we gotta have an answer to that. Otherwise, we're gonna, the result will be either they hang up or hopefully they will have a friend that will call. But usually if a friend calls, they're able to translate, right? So it kind of meets that need, but they're calling because they do need. And it kind of defeats to me the intention of Local Law uh, 30 if we don't have that in place. So maybe that's something that you could start thinking about if you could channel back some uh, constructive feedback so we could get that to the administration. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank you, Chair. Well, we've also been joined by Councilmember Idanis Rodriguez. And here, here's something that I want to point out. And I'm, I'm really thankful that you went through the 311 conversations. I think that's really telling. Uh, I was going to ask about that too, but something else that I heard very plainly and across the board was that we're not we're not there yet. That this is just the beginning, and that the local law really has a lot of blind spots through agency. We talked about NYCHA, DOE, um, uh, HRA is incorporated, but had some complaints about it, and so there are some some real blind spots to the requests for, for the city to respond to this language access issue. But what was, I think, more compelling was this idea that, that this is not just a concept of a technological answer, that this language line doesn't create that trust between a client, a neighbor of ours that needs something, uh, either in service to their community through civic engagement or enrolling in SNAP or enrolling in something that is critical to their family. And instead what we need are humans, people, that can translate in their language, that has that appropriate cultural understanding that can, that can, that can make that happen. Am I hearing that correctly? And so if I'm hearing that correctly, what are we then talking about here? What are we at, what, what, what's the vision and I think we need to start moving into a vision about what we're, we're seeing to fill that gap of people that need to be in our neighborhoods employed. This is, can't be a volunteer. This has already happened on a volunteer basis, including young kids in their own families uh, serving, and the commissioner spoke to, to this herself, that we as children, myself included, and probably Chair Cabrera and, and Idanis Rodriguez, we've all been interpreters for our families. That is not how we need to solve the issue. How do we create a system that allows for that? And I heard worker cooperatives. And so anyway, that was just, I, I wanna just reflect that back that I think that's, that's exciting. Uh, and if anybody wants to take that a little bit further and what you're doing as a coalition to really push us to make that happen, that'd be great. And maybe some models and pilots that we can kind of push forward. But I think that was one of the more compelling things uh, that, that I started drawing a picture about 
uh, myself and how to like think about it in a way that, that is structured and building upon the adult literacy classes because we're not gonna just assume that, I need to stop getting off, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get off the mic here, but we're not just saying that there are communities that don't have language and then therefore we have to solve that problem. We're bringing language literacy to them as well. How do we make that more robust, get them a job so they can go back to their own community and serve as the interpreter? That's an economic development job. Where is EDC in this? Uh, okay, I'm gonna stop. Any, any responses would be great, uh, but thank you for that. I would just briefly say we absolutely welcome the opportunity to have the conversation. I think from each of our organizations, we here and our members that are not at this table, how often they're called into these situations to serve as interpreters, particularly for languages that are not among the top 10 where there are more readily available services. This is an incredible burden that's put onto community-based organizations and just community members on a volunteer basis. We know that the city implementing Local Law 30 is an incredible undertaking and we respect that and we understand that even to add one language above the 10 will make it an even bigger burden. And so I think there is a more complex ecosystem that's necessary here that involves the expertise of community-based organizations and I think the idea of worker co-ops that we've seen be successful in other cities of an interpreter bank where you can actually call on individuals who are trained and licensed as interpreters to support the city or lawyers. If you think about someone going through the asylum process where you're not guaranteed a lawyer, we want to think about these systems and work on this together. Good. Let's do it. That's our next step. That's the next chapter of this coalition. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, keep up the great work. And with that, we'll move on to our next uh, panel, Tasfia Rotmar, uh, Maha Hati, Amy Torres, Joe Him Kim, and Harib Abdul Halim. Okay, uh, we'll begin and we'll uh, just be mindful we have a clock, a two minute clock. And with oh. that, uh, we would like to begin first. If you could take your mic, uh, yes, turn it on. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Tasfia Rahman, and I'm the policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. We thank the committee chairs and um, the members of the committees on government op operations and on immigration for holding this hearing on language access implementation plans. Since 1986, CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and ser services to support those in need. The Asian Pacific American APA population comprises over 15% of New York City. Yet the needs of the commu APA community are consistently overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted. We are constantly fighting the negative and harmful impacts of the model minority myth, which prevents our needs from being recognized and understood. Our communities, as well as the organizations that serve the community, too often lack the resources to provide critical services to the most marginalized APAs. We work with almost 50 member organizations across the city to identify and speak out on the many common challenges our community faces. I'll try not to be too redundant. <laughs> so uh, the needs, um, so APA individuals and families face numerous barriers to success, one of which is adequate language access. Our community is growing and we're growing quickly. In 2014, 35% of APAs in New York City were limited English proficient, which means that no one in a household above the age of 14 speaks English well. Most recently, the percent of LEPs in the community rose to 42%. That's nearly half of our community. That means in our families, children have no choice but to serve as interpreters um, for their families, causing additional stress and anxiety. Um, limited English proficiency also 
prevents parents from participating in school events, dis dis uh, discussions, and meetings crucial to the social and emotional health of their children. Additionally, many APAs have limited literacy in their native languages. This issue highlights the increasing importance of collaborating with community-based organizations and community members to engage in direct outreach to contact isolated families by phone, visits, or word of mouth. We commend the Council for passing Local Law 30 in 2017, which seeks to improve access to the city. Um, we also acknowledge the administration's efforts to implement the mandates outlined in the law. Um, through the Mayor's Office of Mayor Affairs and Mayor's Office of Operations. However, I really want to make the point that the mere availability of languages is not enough. As we've all said, this is just the beginning. Effective outreach is vital to the implementation of language access plans. When reviewing Moya's report on the number of requests and complaints, there were zero requests reported by the agencies such as ACS, Social Services, and HRA, but there were numerous complaints. How is this possible when 42% of our community consists of LEPs and also have the highest rates of need and utilization in services such as Medicaid? We're left to assume that the process has not become transparent and is still yet too inaccessible to the APA community. Um, even after the passing of the laws, there are major barriers to implementation. CACF's member organizations are direct service providers who work closely with students and families in the community. We meet with members regularly to discuss the needs and concerns. Um, in fact, uh, many of our CBOs still receive numerous requests to accompany their clients when going to agency because they're not receiving proper interpretation services from the agencies themselves. Um, additionally, every access point must cons constantly be monitored and improved to ensure groups are receiving communication even in the correct language. For example, from personal experience, my parents uh, every year request that they receive their HRA paper communication, um, namely the Medicaid renewal documents in Bengali. But every year, including this past year, they've received an English version and, strangely enough, a Spanish version, neither of which is really helpful to them. Um, while we appreciate the city's efforts in recording and the number of calls, requests, and intakes regarding language accessibility, there also needs to be a way to monitor the quality of translation and interpretation services. The city needs to improve their data collection and reporting protocols around linguistic accessibility to better reach APA communities. Sorry, this is also why CACF is a longtime advocate for the fair and accurate reporting of racial and socioeconomic data, particularly on the crucial need to include the disaggregation of data. Um, in 2016, the mayor signed a package of data equity bills that mandates the collection and reporting of disaggregated data from city and state social service agencies. Local Law 30 would benefit from utilizing these data equity bills into tracking the diverse, growing, and emerging populations in New York City. And this ensure that the communities that need language services the most are receiving proper linguistic and culturally appropriate resources for their families. Um, the reporting of such data would also address the negative impact of the model minority myth. However, we have yet to see any implementation of the data equity bills. We end by reiterating that um, city agencies provide language translation and interpretation services that are culturally competent. Um, so I think that's one of the um, partial answers to the question that you raised with the three-on-one operators. Um, there needs to be um, a more in-depth and meaningful training when dealing with uh, individuals and clients who have those language barriers, even if they don't necessarily speak the same language. Um, our membership continues to report language barriers their LAP APA community members have been facing when interacting with staff city agencies who need to include cultural competency and training of interpreters and frontline city agency staff. APA individuals are often intimidated about asking for interpretation for fear of imposing on staff or that there may be repercussions for their children and families. Cultural competency help ensure that interpreters and frontline staff are sensitive, and the interpreter uses colloquial language. Frontline staff are respectful and acknowledge cultural practices, and that LEP individuals feel comfortable engaging with city agency. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Next, no fear. I'll go. There you go, your ball. <laughs> I'll go. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mahati. I'm the whole program director and New York City Health Navigator at the Arab American Family Support Center with my colleague, Arij, uh, who's in charge of the preventive services. Uh, on behalf of the Arab American Family Support Center, we would like to thank uh, the Governmental Operation Committee for holding this hearing on the, uh, this assessment of New York City language access service. 
We are grateful for your commitment to enhance the uh, inclusive of our city by increasing access, crucial service, and doc uh, documents in a fuller menu of languages. At the Arab American Family Support Center, we have strengthened immigrant and refugee families since 1994 uh, by promoting well-being, preventing uh, violence, getting families ready to learn, work, and succeed, and amplify the, the voice of a marginalized population. Our organization uh, service, anyone who is in need about uh, over uh, nearly 25 years of experience, we have gained cultural and linguistic competency service. Uh, the growing population of Arab American, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities. Our staff speak not 10, 16 languages, Arab, uh, which is uh, on the list I wanna just to save time. Um, and we, uh, as well as uh, 30 various dialects in our agency. Additionally, we are the only navigator side in New York State that has Arabic-speaking health navigators. We offer our services in this many languages because the need exists within our diversity. In our health program alone, we cover over 1,200 individuals whose primary language is not English. Combining our already existing challenges, limited literacy in native languages is prevalent in many communities we serve and require verbal rather than written translation material, as such as value of culture and language and competence. Uh, our city is rich in very diversity. We cannot utilize a one-size-fits-all approach to any service resource. We can only drive real, effective, and sensible uh, stable change when we offer service in a language that makes sense to our clients. The Arab American Family Support Center is grateful for the improvement we have seen since New York uh, implemented local the theory in 2017, adding Arabic and Urdu, Polish, and French to the top languages. The agency is required to provide service and translation. We have seen increase in the amount of health access and social service material that are available in uh, languages our clients and community speak, namely Arabic and Urdu. This is incredible impact for those upon thousands of individuals who native formally system. Should I finish it? Two more minutes? <laughs> okay. With all moments of progress, we, we know that together we are working further enhanced impact ongoing challenges remain. For example, within the Arabic language, over 128 dialogues are spoken which uh, necessitates sensitivity and awareness around various definite meanings of term. Our currently present clients who speak various dialects are often unable to understand certain materials, even if they are uh, in Arabic, without additional translation to support them. I had that experience with one client over the phone when I called the state. She's from Yemen. They give her someone who speak the Moroccan dialogue which she couldn't understand anything he said, even if it was in Arabic. So I have to request someone from her country to translate for her. Language line is very helpful resource, but entirely accessible to our clients. We have witnessed multiple situations in which Arabic speakers are unable to understand the Arabic dialects being spoken on language line. Further, hospitals and emergency responders, in addition to uh, need additional staff who can provide guidance translation in time of crisis. Imagine someone walking to the emergency room with a heart attack and nobody understands what, what's going on with him without hiring someone who speaks that language. So the phone lines, it's good, but it's not working. I'll stop here, and when you ask questions, we'll respond to your questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Amy Torres. I'm Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC. Thank you, Chairs Cabrera and Menchaca for convening today's um, hearing. So I, I want to um, just talk a little bit about some of the issues that we've noticed and our recommendations around them and then provide some short vignettes from um, my colleagues who have worked directly um, experiencing these things. So um, to first talk about aligning and reviewing language access plans across the city agencies um, and the enforcement of those plans once they're in place. 
We, as other panelists mentioned and as uh, members on the committees mentioned, we were really shocked to see that there were zero requests logged in this report. I think seeing the number zero is more alarming to me than seeing you know, a number in the hundreds or, or anything else because it shows to me that people can't even get in the door to ask for these services. Um, and then we were also disappointed to see that in the report, um, while there was brief blurbs on how issues and complaints were addressed, there wasn't any information on what the complaints were and if they were then being integrated into the plan afterward. Um, this is something that is really important and uh, you know we would be very happy to work with Moya and the council on. Um, and making sure that these uh, plans are then enforced, you know, that, that transparency and enforcement goes hand in hand. Another recommendation that we have that's outlined in our testimony is the hiring and training of staff that are providing language services. So um, a number of my panelists have mentioned cultural competency. When we spoke with our child welfare preventative services manager, she mentioned that during joint home visits that she has, she always requests to have a translator from ACS with her because she has a lot to do during that, during that home visit. Um, but there have been multiple times in which she then has to step in for the translator because of uh, things that they're not translating, things that they're mistranslating, things that they're missing from the conversation. Um, it's really, you know, this is a burden that human services providers, and especially for s staff of color and immigrant staff themselves, carry in a way that other providers don't. We're doing our jobs on top of doing translation and on top of doing very emotionally draining work. Um, and so really an investment in this sector and making sure that these staff are, com you know, compensated with dignity and with fairness. We want to make sure that we retain these staff that really have the cultural competency and shared understanding of our community members. Um, and so I don't want to I don't want to take up too much more time, but you know, just to, to talk through the, the cultural competency piece. It's not just having a shared understanding. You know, there's body language that, that differs across our communities, and we've heard stories about parents who, to indicate respect and that they are listening and engaged, that they would nod or they would, you know, not make eye contact, which would then be put into the report as the parent consenting or the parent not understanding. And then when we would walk through with the parent, we would understand that these are these are signals and body language cues that are just part of our culture. Um, but then has a devastating impact on that parent and that child. Um, and so committing to real uh, robust onboarding and hiring diversity for these staff is critical, hand in hand with investing in human services providers who, who are the primary point of trust for our communities. Um, so thank you for letting me go over. Um, thank you so much. Thank and, you. and the reason why, uh, we're sticking to these two minutes. Uh, so we've been informed that uh, there's going to be another event taking place here, uh, the BLAC, uh, and we have to be out of here by four, and we still have I another apologize. panel. Thank you. So thank you so much. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Yujin Kim, and I represent the Korean community. I'm a project coordinator at the Korean Community Services. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera, and thank you, uh, Chairman, uh, sorry, Chair um, Menchaca, for this uh, convening, um, and the rest of the members of the uh, committee, Immigration Committee and the uh, Committee on Governmental Operations. So keep it short. I will go through um, some of the numbers of our um, uh, demographic and uh, share a story with you with, uh, um, of two of my clients. Uh, so language access is one of the countless barriers that Korean New Yorkers face. Um, as of this year, almost 70% of Koreans living in New York are foreign born. And more than half, 52% of Koreans uh, living in New York were limited in English proficient. Um, however, what's more alarming is the senior Korean population in New York City. So um, nine in 10, that's 94%, of Korean seniors living in New York City do not speak English. Um, so that really highlights the need for culturally competent language services. Um, so 
Um, not only is, uh, is this important, but also the translated materials that the cities publish. Uh, a lot of that is toward toward, um, meaning it's almost like uh, it's, it doesn't deliver the information um, correctly. And sometimes I'll have clients who come in to ask me what this means, even if it's translated into Korean. Um, also, a lot of Korean um, community members do not refer or do not go on city websites or refer to the resources because um, they just, it's uh, distressing for them. It's stressful. Also, the information they feel like is even more incomprehensible than if it was, if they spoke English. Um, so uh, to highlight the need for quality, culturally adept language access services. Um, I would like to share a story quickly of my client, Mrs. Lee. So she uh, does not speak English. She also has a cognitive impairment, which got worse with age. Um, recently, she had, uh, so a lot of the Korean community members prefer they would go seek help uh, to uh, brokers. So they're not, they're not authorized. They're, they're, you know, they're the brokers that provide services that the city should be providing, and they charge people for it. Um, and they, there's no accountability, no oversight. Um, so she receives information word of mouth in the community. Sometimes it's misleading. Um, also, she found out recently that there was a mistake made uh, by a broker on her paperwork for Medicaid recertification, which eventually uh, she went to a fair hearing and requested an interpreter um, who misinterpreted a lot of information that had a lot of inf implications for her Medicaid receipt. Um, services. Uh, for instance, when she was asked why she missed, uh, made a mistake on her form paperwork, she replied lack of resources, which was interpreted then to lack of motivation. You can see how the nuances are completely missed. Uh, moreover, um, uh, recently another, another client of mine called the New York Americans Hotline uh, for information on public charge, only to be told the Korean interpreter was on vacation. So there's no accountability, right? Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you so much for your time and for you know, letting me share the story. Try to keep it short. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Wuan. My name is Joseph Lin. I'm from Asian Americans for Equality. Uh, we're in a lot, uh, we're uh, citywide providing affordable housing, social services, small business lending. So um, a lot of what I'm sharing is from um, a lot of my colleagues. Um, it, it goes to say thank you to the city um, and council members for uh, providing uh, this opportunity to really look at how we can do better as New York City, because New York's the best, right? Um, so one, in this time of fear, I think there's a lot of, uh, we really need to keep in mind, I think a lot of things like site visits really need to be uh, provided translations beforehand or interpretation beforehand because we're seeing things like ACS site visit or the Department of Building site visit is trying to contact a tenant in English and eventually of course the landlord ends up using that as in a reason to evict the tenant. Um, so I think this kind of, um, this we really have to review I think a lot of the agencies in terms of uh, the quality and, and uh, if they're holding up to it. Second, I think a lot of the publicity around Chinese, right? I think we already talked about the dialects. Well then is it, do the people in the community know on language line, is it available in the other uh, dialects, which by the way most of are mutually intelligible. Right? Um, there's a lot of stigma with the community on whether they speak uh, Chinese languages other than Mandarin, whether it's Toy San or Fuzhou, a lot of which um, are seniors, right? Similar to the Korean community, 90, 90 plus percent are link, of our seniors are linguistically isolated, right? So when it comes to critical services like a tenant staying in their home, it is um, of utmost importance that tenants know and uh, all New Yorkers know. Um, and are these, can these translations in terms of turnaround time, especially interpretation, be fast enough, right? We were in a school in Flushing and a, a youth was crying because their parent just got deported and they did not know who to call so they had to go across the street, come to us and ask them to interpret that, right? Do the interpreters have um, training for em these sort of emotionally taxing, um, uh, situations in a time of need. And then finally, in terms of uh, quality of the translation, right, there was a Flushing event where Small Business Town Hall, Flushing was translated as Big Flush, right, literally like, 
And they asked me why the, ch <laughs> we caught it before it went out, but needless to say, there was not really a lot of Chinese small business owners there at that event. So if we really look at some of the ideas about looking at local interpreters, that will make a huge difference and um, going into our companies and you know our um, local New York City minority-owned businesses, immigrant-run businesses, right, and really supporting people that know New York. Uh, so um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the amazing work that you all do. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll call it the last panel. Actually, we have Julia Sherridge. Did I say that right? From Brooklyn Defender Services. And the last call, if you would like to testify, uh, you can see the Sergeant of Arms. Uh, Is Moya in the house? Can you raise your, thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. Great. You may begin, thank you. If you could turn the mic on. Thank you so much. Is it on? Yeah, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Juliana Kereji. I'm a supervising attorney at the Family Defense Practice of Brooklyn Defender Services. I have represented primarily Spanish-speaking clients in child welfare, welfare proceedings since I've started at FDP in 2009. I've also done advocacy surrounding language access issues since 2014. I'd like to thank the City Council, particularly Chairpersons Cabrera and Menchaca, for the opportunity to testify today. I'd like to focus on language access issues primarily surrounding New York City Administration for Children's Services, or ACS. Over 15% of our clients at BDS speak a language other than English. While having a legal advocate that speaks your language makes an enormous difference in the outcome of cases, it is equally important for our clients to have access to services in their native language as they navigate all aspects of the child welfare system both in family court and outside of family court when they're dealing with ACS caseworkers. Our clients' ability to communicate with ACS staff is critical in keeping their families together. Yet for years, our clients have experienced problems with communicating with ACS staff who do not speak their language. Some of the issues that our clients face and continue to face since Local Law 30 was passed are the following. Caseworkers are often incorrectly, uh, sorry, caseworkers often incorrectly assume and assert that our clients speak English, even when BDS staff tell them that our clients do not. Instead of calling an interpreter, ACS caseworkers will use our clients' children, many of whom are the subjects of the ACS cases. They'll use other family members, and in some cases, other respondents, uh, to interpret complex and sensitive information. Rather than providing an interpreter, ACS caseworkers may force families to converse in English during supervised visits, even if the household language is a language other than English. And caseworkers do this so that they can monitor what's being is said during the visits instead of providing an interpreter to, to interpret for the family. Our LEP clients are often not made aware of interpretation or translation services that ACS offers, and they may feel reluctant to assert their right to interpretation services for fear of being retaliated against. In some cases where interpretation services are utilized, caseworkers have used an interpreter who speaks an entirely different language than our client does. A great example is with our Uzbek-speaking clients. ACS caseworkers insist on calling Russian interpreters and they're two completely different languages. BDS attorneys often witness ACS caseworkers using telephonic interpretation services on speakerphone in public areas of family court to discuss sensitive case information. While the goals and policies outlined in ACS's language access implementation plan should ensure that LEP families receive the interpretation and translation services that they need, our experience shows that ACS staff do not follow the policies which confuse our clients and exclude them from participating fully in their cases. Wherever possible, ACS should assign caseworkers that speak the same language as the parents. 
ACS should also include language access protocol review and supervision. So when caseworkers are meeting periodically with their supervisors, they should be reviewing how the language access policy is being implemented and how interpretation services are being provided to the families. ACS, ACS should also make their best efforts to refer parents to outside programs and services that are actually cu culturally competent and provide services in the client's primary language or provide interpretation services. We urge the Council and Moya to hold ACS accountable in enforcing its implementation plan and ensure that New York parents and families can effectively communicate with ACS so that they can have successful cases and reunify with their family. Thank you so much for, for walking us through the, the kind of legal pieces. And we've kind of jotted down a lot of the, it, we clearly have ACS issues as well. So I want to say thank you. And because we have to close, unfortunately, I just want to offer some final comments. Uh, I think it was incredibly productive for us to hear from all our advocates um, and Moya about the challenges in front of us. Even though we have so much to celebrate in a lot of ways about how far we've come as a city to really address this, these barriers, there's so much opportunity to keep innovating. And these, these impacts that are relating to language access in so many different ways are transformative, good or bad. Transformative in a way that a mom can then go and get food services, health services, legal services for their family, um, a senior gets their rent frozen and gets to stay in the neighborhood that they, they live in or IDNYC uh, card or votes in PB because the ballot is correctly translated in their language. That's about trust and that is what we want in our government. Um, or it can be transformed in, in a way that really blocks a father from getting the services that he needs uh, regarding a medical issue. Uh, or just does not return to HRA because he has a job and that one time was just a bad experience and never returns. Uh, or gets a limited access letter and in the frustration, cops are called and now an immigrant father has to interact with police and potentially deported. This is what we're talking about here. Uh, and so I'm really excited about all the ideas that came out and I wanna move forward with Chair Cabrera and really all the council to figure out how we build the better plan for our communities uh, who deserve it and who in this moment where we're in the federal government, um, where trust is so hard to come by that at the very least we give access to language abilities and interpreters where humans are talking to humans about human things and human cases. And so that's important for me and uh, that is my commitment to everyone here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to uh, my co-chair. Uh, I believe that this was a very productive uh, day, a productive hearing, and to all the advocates, thank you for all you do. You, you're simply, uh, I'm running out of adjectives, amazing, uh, life-changing, life-giving. As someone who had to struggle with language issues, uh, it goes beyond even uh, the issues of the services that are provided, the limited resources that they find themselves if they're not able to communicate. But it's also, this is also a psychological piece. And I have to tell you the truth, I, I, I went through that. And I was talking earlier uh, to Brad here about how it affected me for some years, the whole shame factor, uh, you get tagged. Uh, you, you become self-conscious about your accent and, and whether you're able to communicate. I finally learned that English is, is not an accent, it's a language. And, uh, and you know, I have some really good people that spoke into my life. So we must do better and, uh, and we will do better and I know the Moya is, is, is looking forward to working with the agencies alongside with the council uh, so we could have a brighter day. Thank you so much. And with that, today we conclude today's awesome hearing.